Hello everybody, welcome. If you're watching this live, the show will begin at the appointed time in a little while. We're just going to run an interactive pre-show countdown first to give everyone a chance to arrive and settle in. Say hello to us in the live chat if you like. So if you're watching the recording of this show, best idea is to skip to the start of the show proper, which will be about 10 minutes along the timeline. Whichever way, enjoy the show. There we are. <laughs> and here we are sitting in our little rooms. <laughs> um, uh, hello, folks that are already here. Good to see you. Um, and uh, thanks for bearing with us as the countdown goes to eight o'clock. I know some of you may probably think this is the funnest time of the show when nothing's <laughs> going on. <laughs> Hi, Alison. Hi, Graham. Maybe. Secular Cats. Stuart Grant. Um, hello, Rich. Hello, Stuart. Um, greetings from uh, North, Ed North Edge of Dartmoor. Do you know Oakey, oh, wow. Rupert? Do I know Oakey? Yeah. As in Oakhampton? Oh, it as it as in Oakhampton, you mean? Well, you probably. I don't know the colloquial. I'm, I don't know. I'm not seeing the uh, the if same. Oakey, I'm trying to get my. Oakey is a colloquial name for Oakhampton. Oh, <laughs> that's what I would guess. All right, <laughs> maybe Stuart can confirm. Hi, Helen. Hi, Rich DJ. Jill O'Sullivan. Uh, great Green Dragon reprise. Evening all. I wonder who you are. Diorman. Greetings to you, sir. Candide. Yeah. <clears throat> Painting Tracy. Hello. Ancient I think, uh, Cornwall. What do we call you, Ancient Cornwall? Oh, yeah. Nice uh, little... Um, is that Chunquoit in with a sun behind it as your... Um, yeah. Well, it, we, must, we must ask Lizzie if she knows Ancient us, Cornwall. Let us know. Lynn Foley, Michael Cruz... Kelly Murphy, Nikki, Piercy. Uh, thanks for the heads up on the thing, Nikki, earlier, because I always get that wrong. It's a blooming nightmare posting, getting the right. E no, too well, complicated to go into. Nobody would want oh, to know okay. anyway. Yeah, yeah. The, the date thing, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kevin, oh, welcome. From Illinois, yeah. Uh, oh, hello, okay. David, how you doing? And uh, Stuart confirms Oakhampton. That is the one. Hey, it's the good old Oakey. I haven't been there for quite a long time. I've got to be honest. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, we've got God, I, loads of interesting yeah, stuff coming up tonight. Um, mind you, you expect nothing less, I, ex I suppose. <laughs> Chun quite it is. Uh, Kev, hi there, how you doing? And Nigel. Hi, Ben. <laughs> ben, who's here for some henge? You won't be disappointed. Dumnonia. Dumnonia is a cool name. It is. <clears throat> so, uh, anything else we need to uh, tell folks while we're still in... We've got six minutes, seven minutes to go. Wow, Wendy from Maui, really fantastic. Um, <clears throat> uh, what? While we're um, while we're sitting here, um, yeah, twiddling our thumbs. Well, um, I'm sure we have really. It's uh, it's it's funny. Before we came <laughs> on, we had we had technical problems that we've never had before. Uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> so it's a bit of a relief that this is actually happening. <laughs> yeah, gotta love technology. Uh, how te mm. What amazes me is how technology, you don't t touch anything, you don't press any buttons, make any movements, and you, you leave something alone, you come back to it, and it's decided to change itself. Yes. That happens. Yes. Yeah. Just one sulking electron somewhere, and, uh, and everything <laughs> goes to pot. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, it's most likely finger <coughs> trap. That's my excuse mm. for sticking to it. Um, yeah. Uh, Candide says the Cornish bird is awesome. The Cornish bird is awesome. Aww, we, uh, we <laughs> Did you hear that voice from the green room there? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to hang on in there for a little while, though, Lizzie. That's all. 
Uh, okay, hey, uh, Crispina, good to yes. see you. Welcome. That's, oh, hello, uh, Crispina. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you. And uh, <laughs> Sharon, hello, long time watcher, first time in chat. Really great to see you. Hope you enjoy the show. Well, again. Uh, for, and Steve. Uh, for, for, for those of you, um, our other uh, patrons uh, who are already watching, uh, uh, Crispina is. Is oh, yeah. new crew, uh, so yeah, it is. It's lovely to be on board, and uh, yeah, everybody can say hello. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to look at two different chats. Uh, yeah. I think uh, it looks to me like a, a record number of uh, people have joined us before the show starts. Um, we have uh, <coughs> 63 uh, people viewing at the moment. I think uh, yes. for pre-show, that's that's pretty pretty good. Um, mm. I'm I'm so glad. I mean, obviously, it seems to me that folks are enjoying this format, this sort of freewheeling, uh, informal. Uh, thing. Tell you what, it makes a difference to us, doesn't it, Rupert? It makes a very big difference to us, to be honest. Um, yeah. It's uh, no particular schedule to be following other than what we know we're going to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes, uh, it does make a big difference. Um, mm-hmm. uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I, I'm just going to say, uh, hello, Sharon in Alberta. Um, it's, you know what, it's something that I just so love about this the fact that you're all over the place who um uh, i'm just i'm just scrolling back because somebody uh said good morning uh, are you sure from, i'm not a robot uh, new zealand toss toss said uh, morning from new zealand uh well toss it what's it what time is it in new zealand uh it's just yeah. uh, <clears throat> uh and, and jeffrey's in vienna uh, it's just yeah i love vienna I want to go back to vienna sometime. i've never been uh, uh, uh. A very fine city. Yeah. <laughs> so many fine cities. Um, if you're interested, I'm on alcohol free beer this evening, at least for the time being. Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Do you know what? We, uh, uh, we, one of our early shows, it's got to be two years ago. Uh, 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 so um, Nigel is asking us if we uh, listen to In Our Time. Not yet, we haven't. Yes, we uh, have. Oh yes, you I have. Listened you? To it this, I listened to it this morning. I uh, think my partner. Yeah, your it, was not, it was a nice show. Um, didn't cool. tell us anything. I, it sounds pompous, doesn't it? Didn't tell yes. us anything <laughs> we didn't already know. But then uh, yes, we know everything. Uh, but then we'd probably expect that, um, really. Uh, but yeah, it was it was nice, and because we know. Uh, certainly, we we know Sue and uh, Vicky, so it was nice to see them. We we don't actually know Julian personally, but um, no. no, that'll happen. That'll happen. Yeah. Uh, ben, um, y- y- yeah, it does happen on the first Thursday of the month. Uh, that is the schedule that we do try to uh, keep yeah. to. So yeah, well. So generally speaking, the uh, uh, unless there's a good reason for changing it, then the the YouTube. Uh, live show is the first Thursday of the month and the Patreon live show for our patrons on Patreon is the first Tuesday of the month uh, yeah. sometimes as in this month it's um, uh, it's the second Tuesday of the month but uh, but it's generally we try to keep the shows at the beginning of the month um, so that we can spend the rest of the month concentrating on um, everything else yeah. it's all yeah. good yeah. Um, um, what well- what was I going to say? Um, uh, oh, Kevin, um, it's a BBC Radio 4 um, show, uh, Melvin Bragg, in our time. Been going for absolutely yonks. They'll, f- they'll find it in yeah. there. Uh, Decades. On the, on the BBC um, website somewhere. Yeah, it was good. It, it, uh, yeah. it had three archaeologists on talking about megaliths uh, this <laughs> morning. Um, mm. and, and you can tune into uh, just if you if you go on to the internet, put in BBC Radio Four, you can yeah. you can listen to BBC Radio from anywhere in the world. So you you could yeah. listen to it if you want to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lizzie, uh, a note to you in in, 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 in the um, in the green room there. Could you centre yourself in the screen so when you go live, <laughs> you're, not, you're you're visible. There we go. Is that better? Well, uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Amber. Nice to Won't see you. you. 
It'll be a w little while yet. Got a few uh, bits of. Oh, would you believe it? My notes yeah. have disappeared. Oh, there they are. Excellent. Uh, do you know, what? I, I, <laughs> Nigel, I'm going to tell you this uh, in, in my defence here that um, uh, that. <laughs> People talk about my camera, so there's nothing wrong with my camera. My image at the bottom of my screen is crisp as anything, but oh, yeah. um, it's just <laughs> bandwidths and then bouncing out of Mike's machine where he's then spitting out three signals. It's yeah. just, you know, all gets yeah. spread a little bit. Hello, good evening. I'm Michael Bott, and <laughs> and I'm Rupert Soskin. And it's nice to see you all. We are the Prehistory Guys. This is the Prehistory Guys Unplugged, an informal live monthly podcast where we look at some of the recent developments in prehistoric archaeology, air an opinion or two, perhaps answer some of your questions, and generally aim to have a good time. We also like to share the time with a special guest. This month, we're delighted to say. We'll be joined by our good friend Elizabeth Dale, who may be known to a few of you as the Cornish Bird, seeing as she runs a website of that name. She's patiently waiting in the green room already, and we'll be bringing her in in a few minutes. Um, but first, a, a few um, updates from inside the world of the prehistory, guys. Um, what, mm. so, what would you... What do we need to tell good people first? What do we need Welcome to tell? To well, I, I think the first, uh, the, the first and most important thing is actually to uh, uh, say a big thank you to uh, to everybody who has been uh, donating into our fundraising uh, campaign for uh, for our um, uh, the beginning of our filming of uh, Quebec Tepid Stonehenge. Uh, yeah. You've been great, and we're actually you know we're we're a good way towards. Um, uh, the, the first tranche for the uh, for getting going on the first episode, um, yeah. obviously you know, don't stop, folks. You know that because as the money builds up, it's going into the subsequent episodes that will be coming. It's going to be a five part yeah, series. Yeah, uh, I, th so I it's think just, it's great I, that you've all been so enthusiastic. You know, it's lovely. Mm. I think we're pretty close to that. If you don't know what we're talking mm. about when we say Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge, don't <laughs> worry. We, we'll we'll do a little promo for it l later on. Uh, so everybody's in the in the loop there, but it's exciting times, mm. and uh, uh, we yeah, like I say, we do oh, heartfelt thanks to the people that have uh, uh, made all the difference Indeed. and <clears throat> accelerated us towards you know gr you know the green light on it, you know where, where we can start spending mm. money on hotels and, and <laughs> flights and things. Indeed, like that. Yes. yeah, um, and you know that's yeah. not to say. A huge thank you to our Patreon supporters as well. You know who who support us on a month by month um, uh, basis. Uh, I know a lot of you are in the chat here tonight, so mm. you know, you know who you are. You know Indeed. you know you folk what have thrown money at us. Uh, it always astounds us, and we never take it for granted. So anyway, more on that anon. Um, uh, indeed, yes. What else have we got? Uh, we should probably announce that the um, the tour, because you know we do an annual tour. This year we're going to Ireland again, uh, same as last year, or very similar to last year, and that is run through uh, the Archaeology Channel in Oregon, so the Archaeology Legacy Institute. Um, mm. And that is all the details have now finally been pinned down for that. So it's about to go live for booking. If any of you are interested in uh, in uh, coming along uh, with uh, with us on that tour, um, and it's uh, we should actually give an address for that, shouldn't we? Um, I'll put it in the link below. It's not there now. Okay, uh, it's not there now. But um, for future reference, I will put a link to the tour down. Oh, Kevin, really? That's a, that's above and beyond the call. Thank you very much. He's just super chatters, chatted us. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Bless him. <laughs> thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, twelve twelve days in September. What's the first day of that? Just you know, so people know. Uh, the date. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you, you mean keep it's talking while to I memory. just uh, have a look. <laughs> I think it might be the eleventh. Uh, 
Well, hold on a <laughs> you fill me with confidence with your. No, it's not. It's Friday the eighth. It's Friday the eighth. Friday the eighth. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Friday yeah. the eighth for, for the twelve eight days. In Dublin. All mm. over Ireland. All over Ireland. Um, brilliant. Okay, I'll leave the link, but yeah. not now's not the time to go into the details of that. That's just a sort of time thing. Much, much, mm. much um, nearer. In fact, a few days' time, a couple of days' time, um, Saturday. I'll be going down there, but it's the Prehistoric Society um, annual uh, conference, is it? It's got a particular name. Yes. I think that we're going to be looking back over the treatment of prehistory, you know, how it's adapting and uh, for, yeah. through time. Um, so lots of brilliant guest speakers there. So it's nice to be able to go down to London and uh, uh, be at Burlington House where it takes place, just near, just yes. stone's throw from Piccadilly. Uh, frustratingly, I can't, uh, I can't be there in the flesh this uh, this year, so I'm tuning in from over here, uh, mm. which is a shame because it would be nice to say hello to everybody and have a drink afterwards as well. Do you want says bring uh, a bicycle helmet, Michael? Shall I bring a bicycle? <laughs> what? <laughs> just, to, just in case, a precaution. <laughs> Boy Scout, be prepared. <laughs> ah, brilliant. Um, that, so that's that. That's on Saturday. That's what I'll be doing Saturday. And um, you know, the point is, hopefully, we'll be able to give you good report back on uh, you know uh, new thinking and and what people said at the conference and uh, maybe. If, folk or two that I bumped into. Um, yes. Then a bit later on, uh, firming things up, we're on, we aim to be on Anglesey um, at Brinkethley V uh, on the 21st of June for the summer solstice. Not the sort of thing we uh, do usually, but there are several attractions uh, to, to being there is that the lead archaeologists have been involved with uh, excavating at uh, Brinkethley V uh, recently, <coughs> and our friend James Dilly is going to be up there, so it should be quite a party on the uh, on the. Oh, on the do you know what? It's going to be great because uh, uh, yes, I mean James is going to be there, and uh, uh, we do enjoy um, meeting up with James, uh, but uh, also Sarah and Griffiths. Yeah, uh, hopefully is going to be there, and she is just uh, uh, she's an extraordinary woman, uh, a, a wonderful archaeologist, and uh, and Fionn Reynolds, another archaeologist who um, I'm very much looking forward to meeting as well. So uh, yeah, that's going to be a good one. Uh, yeah. I have never been uh, on Anglesey for a solstice. This will be an interesting experience. Yeah. Uh, indeed. Uh, I mean, the aim will be to um, record in some fashion the event, you know, and bring back a, mm. a film about uh, Brink Ethley V and everything going on around it. Last but not least, I owe a lot of people <laughs> an apology, really. <laughs> Do you know it was June last year that we did the principal fil filming for um, uh, Long Barrows of the Cotswolds, that yeah. long-anticipated... <laughs> blockbuster yeah. film that we've been <laughs> promising forever and a day yeah yeah it's underway it's it's getting there uh and uh, the aim is to get it out at least um at least within the next month or two we've been busy though haven't we we've been we've been busy we've been busy alistair thank you bless you kind sir last nice oh, one thank you um so uh, yeah, I think that's it, really. I'm on a promise now. Just, but just to be aware that Long, long Barrows of the Cotswolds hasn't gone away. Um, you know, it's, uh, what, it's going to be about a 50-minute film, I think. You know, one of our nice yeah. films. Not that they aren't all nice, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I um... should have run the clip from, uh, you know, because I've made headway into it. I should have run a, a, a taster clip. But I'm not going to do that because we've yeah. whiffled too uh, too long. I think we it's have time whiffled. To... I do want to say, though, for those of you, some of you might have noticed, I put the link into the chat of the tour page on the Archaeology Channel Oh, yeah, website. well done. Thank you. So that, that's okay. in the chat for those of you that want to see it. Uh, I haven't uh, had a look um, at it yet. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, so I think I think it's time to introduce our guest, don't you? I uh, Ruth, think uh, and so. And get on with the show proper. Uh, thanks for bearing with us there. So our guest for for you, those of you who don't know, um, and these are <laughs> Lizzie's own words. So you know they must be true. She's a Cornish freelance writer, a blogger, and podcaster. She was born on a farm near Falmouth and can trace her family tree in Cornwall all the way back to 1550, a heritage, she says, that she is more than a little proud of. She spent nine years travelling the world, visiting more than 50 countries, but when she came home, she realised some of the best stories and most beautiful sunsets would be found right, right on her doorstep in Cornwall. Cornwall. So she decided she wanted to share those stories with visitors and locals alike, so the blog was born. Her writing aims to bring together the lesser-known stories of Cornish history and Cornish folk and uh, lore and share them with anyone who is interested. She says it is so important we try to record these cultural treasures because if we don't, they will be lost forever and a little piece of ourselves will be lost too. Well said, I say. Um, <laughs> welcome, Lizzie. How are you? Hello, Lizzie. Thank you for Hello. Patiently. Can you see me okay? <laughs> we can see you okay. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. Yeah, we're in varying degrees of fuzzy. Michael looks quite sharp, and then uh, we just. Well, um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's nice to see you. Yeah. How's, uh, and you how's guys. things how down? How, how's the, yeah, we're good. How's things in sunny Cornwall? It's been beautiful today, oh. and because I had a power cut all day, I had a really good excuse to be out walking all day. <laughs> so yeah. I've been out in the sun. <laughs> now, when, well, it, when the sun shines and it is beautiful in Cornwall, it is beautiful in Cornwall, mm. isn't it? There's a particular mm. light that it has. Uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, wonderful. So, anything you want to add to you know my little your your spiel? Actually, I just. Uh, Change the pronoun. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, pre to... that's pretty much it. Yeah, pretty much yeah. wraps it up. Um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, uh, I think perhaps we should add that I am slightly obsessed, and and that you know it's taken over my life. <laughs> but, yeah, but that's yeah. not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> No, right. no, we, we're, yeah, we, we're with you on that. It's funny how these things do that. They do, they do take yeah. you over. Tell me, tell me, I mean, when you started um, the blog and you decided um, that, you know, Cornwall was enough of it, well, of course, it's enough of a subject, but to what degree were Standing Stones and the prehistory, you know, do you, did you... I mean, I'm sure you thought they were always incorporated, but were they a particular inspiration, um, you know, for incorporation in, yeah. the, in the blog? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've spoken about it a little bit before. I mean, I think it's probably if I wanted to trace my interest in history right back to the beginning, it probably all started with, with the, the prehistory stuff um, because we, we spoke about it in the interview that we did a couple of years back, you know, um, when I was a child, that was where my father would drag us all off to go and find a big stone to look at. Um, so, yeah, and, and I sort of continued that as soon as I got my driving license and was able to get around myself. Then I started to go and, and try and find these different places. Um, and, and, you know, back in the, in the 90s, um, this, these places really, really weren't on the tourist trail at all. I mean, I think most people perhaps knew about Merry Maidens or Lanyon Coit, perhaps, but practically yeah. all the other sites were really nobody knew about them. Yeah. Local people did, obviously, but they were definitely not on most people's radar at all. And that made it kind of exciting as well for me. You know, that person yeah. that's always wanted to be an explorer, you know, <laughs> going off and finding these different sites. Um, yeah, it was, it was great fun. Yeah, it was great fun. And I still love that now, really. You know, there's always yeah. new places to find. And what kicked it off? Was it the standing stone on your land, on your farm? No, I mean, that didn't come until uh, 1999. Oh, right. Um, that was, yeah. So yeah, it was put there to, to mark front. the, 
yeah to mark the millennium and also um i forgot to say when we spoke about it before it also marked um 100 years of my family being on the particular farm oh, right. that we're on okay. now yeah right, yeah right. so um so yeah my my father wanted to do something to sort of mark both occasions yeah. i suppose and yeah. um mm. So yes, he he had his own standing stone. He erected his own standing stone, um, but no, I, we we'd been going to sites for for years before that. So. Yeah, well, it's it's clear that you're all obsessed. So that's uh, so that's <laughs> fine. You don't have to be. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great thing actually. You know, because it's a little bit of an insight. Thinking uh, the erection of a standing stone is a commemoration of something. You know why not yeah. always yeah yeah exactly mm. and and um talking about it as well you know and talking about my my father's sort of obsession with finding the right shaped stone and yeah. you know he wanted one that looked as natural as possible and um you know the, where he was going to position it and how deep he was going to sink it into the ground so that it didn't fall on anybody you know just <laughs> those kind of ideas you know, people in the past must have had similar kind of thinking as well, you know, how, yeah. how it was all going to work. And uh, yeah. obviously we had some machinery <laughs> to, <laughs> to help facilitate uh, the erection yeah. of this standing stone. But, um, you know, a lot of the other factors, I think, were the same. You know, mm -hmm. he put it on the, on the highest point on the farm, which is a, a, a hill with, you know, beautiful view over the surrounding countryside. And, uh, but yeah, the factor of it not falling over um, occupied quite a lot of his, his thinking. I should, um, I should think it did. I should think it did. Yeah. How many tons is it? Oh God, I don't know how many tons it is. I mean, it's about there's about four foot underground, and there's about yeah. seven or eight foot um, above ground. Great. So it's a big oh. stone. It's a big Great. Stone. We should probably have a conversation one day about uh, you know the difficulties of erecting a standing stone. In the meantime, I will, <laughs> it's not down at, at, at the moment, but I will put a link down below um, uh, for for people who want to visit uh, the <coughs> bird your um, uh, your website. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've just got it up, up there. I mean, for people that um, um, you know described you, how would you describe your website? The strap line there is Cornwall's Hidden History Blog. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't just cover prehistory, as you can see no. from that. I, I yeah. cover all kinds of stories, basically anything that takes my fancy, really. Yeah. And mm. um, I have, you know, a friend of mine says that I have a bit of a butterfly brain so that I, I mm -hmm. get really interested in one bright shiny thing you know one colorful thing over here and i get obsessed with that and write write about it and then move on to to the next thing really yeah. um so yeah everything from prehistory right up and you know tudors or anything like that any kind of story that i think has been forgotten about or sort of overlooked um and i uh, i think is interesting and uh, you know when I first started writing the blog and I was coming up with some of these things that I wanted to write about, I was kind of like, is anybody going to want to read this? Am I the only one that's going to find this interesting? And I've learned in actual fact, no matter how niche I go, there is yeah. always going to be someone <laughs> who is going to be interested like I am. So, yeah, well, you know, it's very I just... good though. It has to be said, you, you know, you, you bring things to life. Um, very nice thank so, you. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. yeah thank that, you. That, that has to make a difference yeah. so um you i we believe um uh you were recently on the isle of man which um has resonances yeah. for uh, both of us two both rupert and i for different i mean I, I was born there for goodness sakes lived there till i was six years old um, and and yeah. coincidentally and unconnectedly, Rupert, you lived there, and um, I lived you know, there for a couple of years. Yeah, a um, couple of years. But yeah. you've just come back from there. <clears throat> yes. Um, so we yeah. spent me and my other half. We had a long weekend over on the Isle of Man, on a kind of a whim, really. You know, it was what everybody hates of January, February, don't they? It's just like really depressing time of the year. And yeah. um, my other half, you know, he's 
a traveler by nature he always likes to be going somewhere new or planning something and a different adventure and so um he just phoned me one day because he'd been trawling on the internet and found this cheap 25 pound return flight from oh, Bristol really? to the Isle of oh Man. My God, that is cheap. And uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, he said, Should we just do it? And I was like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course <laughs> so, if anybody does. So we went any, to the Isle of Man. <laughs> anybody that uh, so, doesn't, uh, doesn't know um, where the Isle of Man is, I'm trying to make it work. Uh, tech, would you believe? Nothing. I had a little Nothing. animation okay. of the of, of, of a map that shows you exactly where the Isle of Man is. That's oh nonsense. In, oh, sorry, in sorry between, carry on. Uh, Talk amongst yourselves yes, a moment. In, in between England, Gee, Scotland, whiz. and Ireland, right in the middle of the yes. uh, uh, the Irish Sea. Um, yeah. Yes. So it was a bit of a risk because we were fairly convinced that it was going to pour with rain the entire time that we were there. Um, but in actual fact, we had beautiful weather, so it was it Fantastic. worked out really, really well. So. Mm -mm -mm. I know what the problem is. It's uh, it's oh. such a, an amazing place, though. The archaeology on the Isle of Man is just phenomenal. Uh, ta da! <laughs> well yeah. done. Yeah. After that, I wanted to surprise you. Now it's just a damp squib, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I you probably it. already knew, you probably already knew where the Isle of Man was anyway. <laughs> Just be, being clear. Yeah. Uh, have you talked about favourite sites yet? Sorry, I was slightly distracted by my silly map. On the Isle uh, of Man? No, we haven't. We, yeah. Yes. What's your favourite site on the Isle of Man? Well, I don't think I'm really qualified to speak because I only was there for a weekend, so we we oh, didn't sure. really get to see all of the stuff that you know. Obviously, there's a massive amount of, of prehistory yeah. stuff on there. Um, mm. uh, but what I did see, yeah, was was uh, was amazing. There was that, um, is it Castel Inard? Ca Castel Inard. Castel Inard. Yeah. 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 yeah, that, yeah, that was it, beautiful. Uh, and the, the setting is just, yeah, it was just lovely. Really, really mm. special. Mm. And um, some of the inc incredible uh, Celtic crosses that they've got there yeah. in the in the churches and in the graveyards oh my goodness the carving mm. on them was just stunning really yeah. really fantastic yeah. Yeah. um and uh, yeah my main disappointment was not getting to see one of the ship burials but yeah <laughs> next time hey -ho. Yes. Hey -ho. Well, i don't think yes. uh, um, um, i to remember to send you a couple of grid references um yeah <laughs> I'll We've got no plans to go back to the Isle of Man, but it's always a good idea to keep it on the cards because it is quite uh, unique, the variety of uh, megalithic sites uh, on the island. Uh, did you know yeah, sure. that um, it has its own variety of pottery? Oh, In, no, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, it's uh, Ronald's Way Ware. Ronald's yeah. Way? Yes, okay. named after the airport. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, isn't that the airport? <laughs> yes. That's right. Uh, have did they, did they find it when they were building the runway? or <laughs> Basically. <laughs> I don't know the details. Um, but it's certainly, <laughs> okay. that, that's where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I am from uh, the Isle of Man, Kevin. Yeah, like I said, thanks. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, Janet said, Michael, are you quite yourself? <laughs> <sighs> no. Uh, I, I, I know exactly what it is. I'd lock, uh, for safety's sake, I'd locked everything up. So I won't, you know, if I touch anything, it won't change. But the trouble is, if I touch right. something, it won't work. <laughs> so I had to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I got Amazing. that sorted. <laughs> Shall we move on? Shall we get, get to our first bit of uh, uh, first item? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. To, uh, to Let's cover do tonight. this thing. All right, cool. Here we go. And it is a... Um, yeah. <laughs> well <Yeah>. done. <laughs> 4,500 year old Sumer <laughs> Sumerian <laughs> palace uncovered in Iraqi desert. Um, so it's interesting that we're, you know, going back to Iraq again, because we seem to have been focusing quite a lot uh, there. But, um, and this is quite... Interesting, because this is quite the other end, because 
The place we were talking about in a thing we did before was at Lagash, and Gersu can't be 40 miles away. Reaching the culmination mm. of a search that has been going on for the past several years, a team of archaeologists affiliated with the British Museum has finally unearthed the long-lost remains of a Sumerian palace and temple in the ancient city of Gersu on the southern plains of Iraq. These ruins date back to at least the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, taking Mesopotamian archaeology to the very edge of the founding of modern civilization, a milestone credited the ancient Sumerians. Sumerians first invented writing, created the first code of laws uh, between the years 3500 and 2000 BC. I'm going to just skip, you know, because we know that stuff, but the legendary city of Gersu, which is located at a site now known as Tello, was one of the first cities in the world and a major center of Sumerian culture and society. It is considered the cradle of civilization, as are quite a few places, and <laughs> one of the most important heritage sites Indeed. in the world that very few people know about. Um, uh, by the discoverers of its palace and temple, who were led by Dr. Sebastian Ray, a British Museum curator and expert on ancient Mesopotamian civilization. Sorry about the ads. Um, so what's interesting about this is these excavations had taken place after you know a huge gap in time. Um, I, I think it said something around about a hundred years. Um, and most, um, uh, yeah, most and it wasn't at all helped by the Iraq War and uh, and all of that that uh, they'd oh. actually lost the true location of it. And oh, it was, had they, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think there were a lot, a lot of naysayers uh, telling Sebastian Ray that uh, he wasn't going to find anything. But nevertheless, yeah. latest yeah. excavations began at Gersu in 2015 yeah. as part of a joint project funded by the British Museum, Getty, and the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage in Iraq. Uh, it was part of British Museum's broad Iraq scheme, which was launched to help protect endangered sites in Iraq and Syria from falling victim to the ongoing depredations of the notorious Islamic State. Mm. Yeah, the, it, it had not been explored for more than a century before they um, yeah. arrived at, at the scene. There were 100,000 cuneiform tablets uh, in, in, yeah. you know, from those original uh, excavations, I suppose, you know, that accounts for a lot of them that are being in the in the uh, British Museum. I've got an example of a tablet there. Um, it's just beautiful, isn't it? Well, it's beautiful. Yes. It is uh, gives an account of barley rations uh, issued yeah. with to. I know. Monthly... I was I was laughing about this actually because um, it just struck me as quite funny that these cuneiform um, tablets that they'd found were all sort of record keeping and administration and i they thought it's kind of was it yeah was it is it depressing that they were so into their record keeping or is it you know is it really useful uh, information it was kind of like i think it says yeah. more about uh, the, the, where in the city they were found because yeah. because mm. uh, funnily enough uh, you know shortly we'll be getting onto another piece of cuneiform yeah. that was found elsewhere but uh, but I mean, it, it just shows in the British Museum. I can't remember how many it is, but the British Museum still has thousands upon thousands of cuneiform tablets or broken you know, pieces of uh, cuneiform yeah. tablet, which they have still not translated. Uh, no. It's just a constant project of, of translating all these things. So the mm. stuff that they're finding mm. out regularly is is breathtaking and uh, and the fact that this particular one uh happened to be record keeping uh, i thought was quite funny i mean you mike you said uh you mentioned that uh in the earlier excavations that they uncovered a uh, hundred thousand tablets yeah. i thought it was really funny that um, these uh, in later excavations they found another 200 tablets which had just been tossed into a pile of debris yeah. by the 19th by the, century yes. excavators you know that <laughs> uh, so back then it was uh, they're just looking for bling you know they yeah. Yeah, yeah. pieces of pottery whatever yeah, I don't care. um <laughs> yeah. uh, and yeah. so they just tossed all these things away unbelievable <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, hats off to Dr. Ray, you know, for pushing on through because everybody was telling him uh, 
uh, you know, not to do it. You won't find anything. I always felt that yeah. was the pessimistic view, he says. If you had a new set of tools and technology, you can go back to those damaged 19th century excavations. So it seems uh, also uh, that uh, drone footage, I mean, talking of new tools, drone footage uh, was ma majorly responsible for um, uh, revealing the presence of subsurface remains that had never been uh, observed before. Um, and, you know, then you get, begin to get into the mud brick walls and find the actual palace of the king. They seem to be, don't seem to have been focusing on the buildings so much, you know, as the artifacts and, and no one, you know, just extracting mm. all these things. But here's, what about, what is this? Yes. They got it, the cuneiform just... tablets, but from it's their excavations good. recently, this is the reconstruction of what's there? Yeah. I mean, my goodness. Yeah. So that's four and a half thousand years old, and you know, I mean, it's Las Vegas, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's not, yes, isn't it? Quite a oh. few uh, things spring to mind. Um, so yeah, the discovery of the the, the temple, there's so much uh, detail. I mean, that's the thing, I suppose, that we we know so much about. We never know enough, but of all the places in the world where things are going on uh, between uh, 2000, 3000, 1500 BC, Samaria has to be, you know, <coughs> one of the best because we got the tablets tell us what where they were actually um, up to. And there's a problem, you know, yeah. you've got so many of them. Um, what are they going to tell you? How, where do you begin to analyze and, you know, pull? That information together so there's some kind of narrative uh, that, that helps you it's um yes well cue the next article really i was just thinking the same thing <laughs> <laughs> okay okay uh well let me uh let me do that thing um and we're uh, back pretty much uh well in the same place and um, we've got an article about artificial artificial intelligence deciphering said um, texts, uh, cuneiform texts, yeah. ancient Babylon yeah. texts, and and uh, finding a beautiful lost hymn. Um, yeah. Uh, that particular tablet it's... you can see there is a fraction of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which again, mm. you know, uh, needs help sort of sorting out what the missing. Uh, bits are. Um, mm. I won't talk but, about the Ashmolean yet. I'll maybe maybe yeah. talk about that in a, in a second. <laughs> oh look, there's a cat. I, I'll tell you um, what. I, I'm more fascinated by your pop-ups at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? I wish I must fi find a way of getting rid of them. Anyway, yeah, well, uh, um, you know, one of the the really amazing things about this piece of research, and and the real reason that we put it in, it's not. Okay, it's exciting that they've translated this hymn. Uh, they're calling it a hymn. It's a hymn or a prayer or a poem, whatever you like. Poem, but yeah. the but the point is that uh, the the fragments of uh, of uh, tablets, whether it's Babylonian text, whatever, you know, these various Q form texts, uh, there are uh, they're in different places around the world. You know, the British Museum has got loads. Uh, the uh, the muse the Iraqi museum in Baghdad has got loads, and they've had a project since 2018 where they've been digitising them all, so they're photographing them, uh, you know, scanning them all and getting them all online. And what made this so completely amazing was that they put AI on the case. They actually um, wrote uh, a dedicated piece of AI software to do this, which they called Fragmentum. Uh, but, uh, but the thing is that they, they just let uh, the AI crack on with it. And yeah. in seconds, it translated what would have taken, they estimate that it would have taken the uh, archaeologists and researchers 30 to 40 years yeah. And the AI did it in in like a second. Um, and is so it, isn't it able to sort of 
jigsaw some of the pieces together as well. So it, it, yeah, it's yeah. got, you know, so many thousand pieces on there, but the technology can actually go, oh, that bit actually goes with this bit and can, yeah. you know, bring them yeah. together in a way that for a human to do that, it's going to take probably years yeah. and years and years and years of research. So, so again, you know, the ramifications of, uh, of other things like, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, where they're mm. still taking pieces of parchment and painstakingly trying to find which piece fits with this piece. But now it looks like AI is just going to completely wow. transform this kind yeah. of research. There'll be another one um, of those moments, won't there? You know, when a new technology starts spewing out loads of new stuff, there won't be the time of day, in time in the day to, to process it all. No. <laughs> You know, no. Well, it, it's it's like as you know, as you say, you look at things like uh, to, to, it couldn't be less archaeology, but uh, but yeah. you know things like uh, you know the James Webb Telescope uh, or the yeah. Large Hadron Collider that suddenly you know in in a in a matter of seconds you get more data than you could uh, uh, than you could actually wade through and uh, and decipher in a year, and mm. uh, and and that's what's happening here. You know that mm. there's just but isn't be... it um, becoming open access? So the general public yes. will be able yep. to go onto it yeah. as well, and you can play detective yourself, can't you? You 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 know. Yeah. So if you've got thousands of people around the world that are all interested and and researching this and looking into it themselves, they're going to start adding to that yeah. information yeah. in the AI. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very exciting, isn't it? Um, yeah. uh, do we want to get into details here? No, I think you have summed it up. I think you've summed it up. That's exactly what I was going to do. Yeah. The, yeah. the hymn that has been deciphered on this particular one uh, tablet reads, uh, yeah, as follows. Uh, do the we know river, why they're uh, calling it a hymn rather than a poem? Um, uh, do you know, it, uh, that, was, that was my thing. I, uh, 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 go on. Cause... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's only because uh, for me... Uh, a, a hymn is is sung, and I'm probably wrong. Yeah. I'll probably be shot down in flames by so many people. But so you know, I saw this and I thought, well, how do you know it's a hymn? You know, it's, it's a prayer, yeah. it's a poem. Even if it, if you want to say, well, it's a sacred poem, whatever, fine. Um, it's yeah. just hymn seemed a bit of a leap to me. That was all. Yeah. Well, yeah. we just had, I, I thought have the to... same. I was like, how do they know that? Okay, that didn't strike me. So we need to look up a definition. The river Arastu created by Nidim, Nidimud, the Lord of Wisdom, waters the plain, drenches the seeds, pours out its waters into lagoon and sea, its blooming and green on his fields. The meadows shimmer with fresh grain. Thanks to him, the corn piles up in heaps and heaps. Grass grows high for pasture for the flocks, with riches and splendor befitting mankind. All is covered in glorious abundance. Well, I mean, it's lovely. It's very evocative, isn't it? You know, it is. the, the yeah. shimmering fields of grain, and yeah, it's lovely. Um, yeah, it uh, it certainly gives you a different perspective on what is desert today. Yeah, mm. um, and and how they were managing it as well. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah. It's anyway. Quite yeah, we could go off in all sorts of directions. It is fascinating to me, though, that once we lift the, the corner of this thing and we looked at the discovery of the tavern in Lagash, which is, what, 40 miles down the road or so? It's not far. Yeah, roughly. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you know, from the, roughly the same time period. And then they're jumping up and down about finding a tavern in Lagash. And then they're jumping up and down about finding a palace in, <laughs> in Gersi. So, uh, yeah. that, that's fascinating. And I was at the Ashmolean Museum uh, last week, and I had my, uh, you know, I, my mind was blown by it because one of the most important documents that helps uh, order the events at that time and, you know, helps us know what was going on there's a thing called the Sumer Sumerian List of Kings. Now, there's several varieties of it, um, but one of them is in the Ashmolean. And I just, I, I didn't, I wasn't going there to see it. It just happened, I found out it was there when I was there for other reasons. And just turning the corner, 
And it's not a big thing. It's just sort of quite quite small, sort of square block with the cuneiform on it. And to have that be so important and having, you know, uh, dipped our toes in the waters of uh, Mesopotamian history, uh, it was so exciting to be there. And alongside that was a, sort of a fragment of Gilgamesh, would you believe, and a couple of the other tablets, mm. sort of more of the mundane type that we've seen there from um, uh, Gersu, uh, bricks from Babylon. Uh, it was just mm. overwhelming <laughs> to be zapped <laughs> by yeah. this uh, stuff from uh, from Sumeria, from ancient Sumeria. Um, fabulous. Um, uh, so, um, do you want to move on to the next? Anything more to say about that before yeah, I, we uh, I don't move on to the next? Else. Do you have anything else to say about that, Lizzie? I think. Uh, I mean, no, people are. Uh, it, you folks are uh, 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 obviously having some opinions about that. I think. Yeah, we don't know, do we? I, although I think it's funny that Graham said uh, because it doesn't rhyme English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we. <laughs> We I'm like sorry, our because, pros. In, indeed. I'm sorry, because I'm concentrating on clicking things and, and making sure the next thing pops up right or not. I haven't been yes. paying attention to the, uh, uh, to the chat. Pig76 says, I'll call it a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Michael, wrap it. Yeah. 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 Well, let's, let's move on before we get ourselves in trouble. Oh, no, no <laughs> blooming pressure. Come on, let's, uh, let's move on. Archaeologists on a 3,000-year-old wishing well in Germany. I love this. Yeah. I uh, love well, this. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Rupert, tell us about these, uh, the, this, this bit of pottery, if you can. Um, I don't know if you've, uh, uh, off, off the top of your head. Do you, do you want to read um, from the, the text there? I'll go back to that. Uh, I can do. I mean, I've got my own notes uh, in front of me. Oh, sure, yeah, but, okay. Um, uh, but uh, it's it's the fact that because the interesting thing here, we've actually talked okay, about wells yeah. on a number of occasions uh, in the past. That for me, there's something really, um, you know, we bang on about uh, when you've got, when you when you've got things that are about people's lives rather than burials you know that are about yeah. the deceased when you've got stuff that's about the ordinary people and how they lived and so whenever a well is uh, is excavated and there have been a few found in recent years have been a few found in poland um uh you know and it's nearly always because they're doing excavations for whether it's roads the ones found in poland were all because they were building this new main road uh, this one is um what was the building here i can't remember off the top of my head but um but it's basically it's a building development and um yeah uh, and they found this well now the, the thing is they've actually found uh, there's about 70 wells they've found that they've excavated in this region mm. and this is the only one that Appar had apparently artifacts that one. in it yeah. uh well, well done. That's that's the picture of it there. Uh, it's the yeah. only one that had artifacts in it. And the the fascinating thing about these artifacts is that you can tell that they were deliberately put in the well. And it's an astonishing uh, collection of stuff. So, uh, Michael, you showed the pottery there, which is you know already these these are not um, daily use cups and things like that they you know they uh, they're pots that would have been um quite fancy uh, for the time so that you know they've clearly been ritually placed and trust me it takes a lot for me to say something like that <laughs> but um but also the uh the you know the amber beads and stuff like that but also bits of animal um yeah they uh, uh, and I found that interesting. It must have been a pretty stinky well, I would have thought. Yeah. But um, uh, but uh, they found uh, over seventy uh, finely crafted clay vessels. Uh, it says uh, twenty six bronze robe pins. Oh, well done. Good timing. Uh, yeah. In that picture there, uh, a bracelet, two metal spirals, four amber beads. Um, 
and I'm now scrolling down through my very bad notes. But um, but yeah, the pieces of um, animal. Um, do you remember what they were? There was um, a tooth. There was an animal, uh, an animal tooth, and I was curious. Yeah, the tooth why they was bound, wasn't it? Yeah, and and why we don't know what animal it's it's from. You know, it looked like a sort of a canine kind of tooth in the picture, which I thought yeah. was quite odd. Mm. So calls in, you know, in that thing, is it instinctual to uh, ch chuck a, <laughs> a coin or anything into yeah. a, a wishing I mean, uh, well? In, it almost seems that way sometimes. It's yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, we, we down in Cornwall, um, there are hundreds of, of wishing wells and sacred yeah. springs, and there's a really long tradition of leaving things either in the water or around uh, the well. And it, it kind of brought to mind for me, there's a well down west near St. Loy called um, Alia, and it is not associated with any saint, it's just an, uh, a very ancient spring. And the tradition there is to drop pins into the water. Oh. So you go there as, as a married couple or as a boyfriend and girlfriend, a courting couple, and you drop each of you drops a pin into the water, and how those pins land in the base of the well says something about your relationship, how long you're going to be together, you know whether oh. it's going to be a happy relationship, that kind of thing. And it just I don't know why it wow. reminded me of that. And I think it's just really interesting. This is something that's uh, it's, it's kind of universal, you know, across the world where you get people leaving things in water and especially yeah. leaving things in springs and, and wells. And it's kind of that, the idea that it might be a sort of a gateway to another dimension, another realm, you know, uh, because yeah. of, of that water coming up out of the ground and you're obviously offering something, but you're also making a connection, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I just found that the idea that across the world we're, humans are doing the same thing just fascinates me so. yeah. Mm. yeah i mean it fascinates us i don't know what it says if it's something in the psychology or anything like that but you know we've mm -hmm. all done it without uh, without question or, or or thinking well that was weird <laughs> you know <laughs> i have to say what makes me chuckle is uh, when when we were in ireland last year and we were in a hotel in cork and at the back of the entrance to the hotel, it was still outside, there was a waterfall at the back and a natural pool form at the bottom of the waterfall. I said natural. I think it was natural, but um, that's where it was built. And there was a pool at the bottom of the waterfall. And it was full of money. And I thought, but this is on hotel property. You know, <laughs> how... I wonder how often they actually scoop that out, and uh, yeah. <laughs> what do they do? And where do does it go? <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, Carrie yeah. says uh, it's surely a uh, a passed on action, tossing things into water, mm. and yeah, I mean, I would tend to agree with that. But it it, it just seems strange that it has survived, you know, as, as a thing that it doesn't die as, as a tradition yeah. a, a habit you know and it, it it's so easy to take on it's something in the psychology takes hold well this is what you do with your penny you there's a wishing well and once that yeah. idea is set there's no yeah. you don't ask questions afterwards it seems except we're asking the question yeah. now but yeah strange one yeah. don't know about that all right yeah. are, are we clear to uh, uh move on yeah um, I'll tell you what, Lizzie, now would be a good time, because I know you've been doing something, you know, uh, well, fairly recently, what was it, in the in the summer? Uh, you did a dig um, on a site uh, on September. Bodmin... Uh, in September, on, uh, yeah. on Bodmin Moor, um, yeah. called King Arthur's Hall. Tell yeah. us about, can you... Can you can you describe King Arthur's Hall, what it is, where it is, and Can why I it's describe King Arthur's Hall? Okay. Mm. Um, so King Arthur's Hall is a, uh, a sort of rectangular monument 
um, in the middle of Bodmin Moor. Um, it is, I looked it up, it is 48 metres long and it's 21 metres wide. Um, and it has uh, 50 plus of these uh, megaliths uprights, or they used to be upright. A lot of them are sort of, as you can see, leaning, <laughs> um, that sort of line uh, the edge. It has a rising spring. It's thought to have a rising spring in the centre because even in the height of summer, there is always water inside. Um, it's in an amazing spot on Bodmin Moor. As you guys know, I, I absolutely, I just love that area of Cornwall. But it's in an area called Emblance Downs, or King Arthur's Downs, actually. And um, you've got Garrow Tor on one side of you. Um, directly north of you, you've got um, Row Tor. But you've also got a, a, a plethora of monuments in that area. So you've got... Loudon Stone Circle, Stanton Stone Circle, there's Fernacre Stone Circle, there's Emblance, which is twin stone circles, there's Alex Tor, which has got a curbed cairn on the top. So there's just a whole load of stuff going on within about a mile and a half of that right. uh, King Arthur's Hall. But the thing about King Arthur's Hall is nobody knows what it is. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has a different theory um, as to what it is. Yeah, I, I, it, it's a difficult one because it can't be there. There aren't any dates yet for it. No, yeah. Um, so that that was the the purpose of the the dig that I was involved in. Um, right. There was a, a pot of money given to Cornwall Archaeological Unit and Cornwall um, Area of Outstanding Natural Natural Beauty. Um, to uh, do a number of different projects, but one of them was to actually put a trench um, through the embankment of King Arthur's Hall and to take some of these um, o OSL um, samples. Uh, Optical, to get optically the stimulated luminescence. Yeah, <laughs> that one. Um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, to, to pin down a date because there's all these theories uh, about um, what the hall is and um, I I can't say exactly which one I sign up for but I'm <laughs> I want it to be prehistoric um, yeah. that's what I want it to be and that's what instinctively I feel that it is but talking to the archaeologists that were there they yeah. put forward some convincing cases for it being something else so yeah. if, do you want me to run through the, the various different ideas of what it is? Um, yeah, so I, I'm just a, going to, you know, just so, you know, to reinforce what you've just said. The, the problem with it being uh, prehistoric is this form, the, a rectangular mm. form. That would be so unusual uh, for anything yeah. from the Neolithic or, or the Bronze Age. And yeah. yet, I'm just and thinking yet, of and another yet. article that's coming up in a few down the line where there might fly in the face of what you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, tell us... Say that, uh, from what I... Sorry. Uh, t t tell us what the varying um, uh, theories are. Okay, so um, because it has uh, uh, so much water in it at certain times of year, there is this idea that if it was cleared of all the undergrowth that's in it now, that it would be a flat surface of water so there's a, this theory that it was for scrying or it was for observing uh, the stars there's an idea that it was a ritual space for what we, we don't know um, then there's another idea that it was some kind of meeting place um, for prehistoric communities that were that were in the area um, there's the idea that it was a medieval pound for animals, which I don't like because you wouldn't put your animals in an area that was really wet like no, that. that to yeah. me, but but that's one of the one of the theories um, is that it's a medieval pound. Um, there's an idea that it was a reservoir that it was purposely built to store water, um, oh. perhaps for livestock or for this uh, some tin streaming in the area. So yeah. that, that's another one of the, of the theories. So, yeah, the, there's a uh, swimming pool. <laughs> Mud so bath, yeah, there's you mean. A, a whole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a whole load of, of ideas of, of what it is. And, and hopefully just getting the date 
will actually narrow the field, won't it, as to what it could be. Yeah, and Crispina mm. says the houses uncovered by Riverside Project at Durrington were rectangular. Uh, yeah, but nobody's going to be living here because, as you say, it's completely swampy and, uh, you know, there's a... In yeah. the middle, isn't do we, it? Yeah. Do we... Oh, I have to, you know, I have to raise the thorny aspect here, though, of uh, it, it might be boggy now. Do we know it was boggy 5,000 years ago? Do we? Yeah, I don't uh, know. You know, they, 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 might have, uh, they might have done... Uh, some optically stimulated luminescence, but did they yeah. sink any augers? Have fair got point, any Rupert. For, yes. fair yeah, point. Yeah, they did. Uh, there was a team came down from Birmingham University that did, the, you know, core samples, um, and they went meters down uh, in the yeah. center of of the um, of so, the hall. Uh, have those results and, and come around back yet, it as well? No, we're have still those, waiting. So we did it in September, and we were okay. told um, we were told in the spring. So hopefully, I'm hoping in the right. next few weeks. Something That'll be really will, interesting will to, to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm uh, very excited Doug to hear because... Doug asked for a, a clarification there. Uh, yes, Doug, it's King Arthur's Hall, H A W. Hall, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with King Arthur. <laughs> No, sure. <laughs> Although there are there are the people that think oh it was a meeting hall for King Arthur you know that was another one of the theories but the the name is actually a bit of a contentious um, thing because of the the constellation that is you know Arthur there's this idea that it's all to do the name comes from the star constellation rather than the actual king but what you okay. have to remember in Cornwall is every uh, is arthurian or something Arturus. like that i'm not very good with uh, oh taurus thank you yeah maybe yeah i'm not very good with my constellations Ar um, is so... a star it's not a constellation yeah oh is it not sorry no, the const um, no, no. Is, i can tell you it's in Bootes, <laughs> but um Mm. Yeah. I wonder what. Mm. Um, so anyway, yeah, everything um, in Cornwall has an association with King Arthur, doesn't it? So we we uh, yeah we're obsessed. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. Never let the facts get in the way of a good story. No, exactly. <laughs> we shall wait with bated breath the dating on that because that'll narrow the yeah. choices down quite quite considerably. Fingers crossed on a you know <laughs> an early date that would be a, a surprise, but mm, rather suspect it might be a bit more recent myself. Hey ho! Oh, okay. Got, yeah, well, I've got a similar thing just down up the road here. You know, which as uh, 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 mounds within the forest, within the w woods. In there, I've shown you them to you, haven't I, uh, Rupert? Where you've you have, got uh, yeah. an, an earthwork, considerable earthwork in the in the woods, uh, which most people say is um, an Iron Age fort. Nice would be, but it's most likely medieval uh, containment for. You know, bits of uh, the, the land there because it's got sharp corners and stuff. It doesn't really. Jive I think what throws being... people mm. with King Arthur's Hall is the stones. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there are some really. I mean, the the picture that you show didn't really um, show you those those huge great uprights that you have okay. around the edges. Um, mm. And I think that's what throws people because, you know, they are so hefty. It seems a bit over the top to put them in just for a pound, or you know, it was like, why are they there? It is is I think that that what throws people and what brings them to conclude that it's something much older. Um, but yeah. one of the archaeologists proposed a theory that the stones that are in the hall were actually part of a stone circle or a different monument, and yeah. that they've been brought there and and utilised yeah. within the hall. So, yeah. yeah. A fascinating, yeah. but um, um, quite um, not uh, well known about um, little no, site there. No. Um, but could, it'll yeah. be very interesting. If you, interesting. Co if you to come to, to Cornwall, you see, are. I will I will give you a little tour, and then you can uh, give your own opinion. It, it's Fantastic. going to happen at some point. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> was it? Is it Ursus? You keep Ursa, threatening Ursa. me, but <laughs> is was it Ursus? Ursa Ursa Major? Ursa, aren't they the Great Bear? Isn't that associated? Ursa Major and Ursa Minor are the great yeah, bear and the little yeah. bear. Yes, but isn't so the great bear, bear associated with Ursa Major? Yeah, yeah. as, um, as uh, Hyper Bum Fuzzle uh, was actually pointing out. Hi there. Ursa. That might be where I got Glad confused you made with there being a constellation. Then. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that <laughs> may well be it. There's always, there, there's always <laughs> something. Anyway, um, so from a well in the ground, hole in the ground, 
And uh, yeah. kind of, uh, well, talking of uh, holes in the ground. Um, <laughs> to... <laughs> well done. Well uh, done. Uh, uh, it's the way I tell them. <coughs> um, <laughs> Seamless 2,400-year-old <laughs> flush toilet unearthed in China could be one of the world's oldest. Yes. Um, yeah, toilet found in uh, Shanxi province's Huihuang city ruins and was likely used by high-ranking officials during the early years of China's first unified empire. There we are. Well, looks quite modern in design to me. <clears throat> it, uh, it's astonishing, isn't it? And and when you think um, that the the mechanism of this, so it would have flushed. I mean, they they reckon that um, the, the the type of toilet uh, it, it would have had to have been a high ranking uh, or you know a high status individual, and and it would have been the serfs flushed by the servants. The, 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 yes, uh, flushing after the event. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean it's it's certainly the it's the only one, and and uh, by definition, therefore, the oldest ever found in China. And as a flush toilet, it's uh, technically as a flush toilet, it's uh, it's the only one of its type in the world because there are, you know the other places. Like, so if you look at uh, the Roman system of you know which was essentially flush toilets, but with the Roman toilets, it was a constant flow of water you know it was irrigated yeah. so that you had this constant flow of water to take everything away uh, but this is actually you know essentially it's a it's a, a, a modern style of cistern it's it's fantastic design for two and a half yeah. thousand years ago yeah. Um, yeah when when was the first actual you know um, flush toilet with a cistern actually invented it's not until oh, well, I don't know. There, in the right? article, it said um, in the article it said about Elizabeth the first was uh, they thought that that was the first uh, uh, yeah, toilet yeah. was Elizabeth oh, so, the first. Yeah, the first the modern manual century. flush toilet was invented in England in 1596 uh, by Sir John Harrington. That's just 90 years after this house was built. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh wow! Yes, that's a thought, isn't it? What? Well, originally this house didn't need flush toilet. No, that's true. Yes, yeah, you need to do some core samples in your garden. That would be uh, an interesting thing. To do. Well, doing uh, the, best. So the, o the only the thing that upset patch. me about this article, and I am not going to apologise for my schoolboy uh, humour, uh, but uh, it said that the toilet was found at the number three site, and I just should have been the number two site. <laughs> Come on. Uh... <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. uh, bad man is there anything yeah. really to uh bring out uh here i mean it's a it's a nice well, thing but no uh mm. no it, it's one of those uh you know you don't need to uh go into hugely in-depth detail I just i think it's you know all joking aside it really is interesting when you find uh, you know what we would consider to be modern thinking, you know, and and you you look back to something thousands of years ago, uh, and see that you know people similarly to uh, you know you you dig up a city or you dig up a palace, the reconstruction of the palace at Gursa, that, that you're looking at something that is so advanced, and yet we still have this thing in our heads about people being primitive. And they were so yeah. advanced. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think when you get tech like this, uh, yeah. that it, it's just it's fascinating in its own. That's it, really. And we can't begin to you know really talk about the context because it would be pretending of us because it's just something we don't know about. Uh, you know, it said what this the Warring States period in China. No yeah, idea uh, what that is about. Yet, yeah, I mean, no. I, I I raised my hand to the, my level of ignorance with oh, Chinese yeah. archaeology. I just <clears> uh, <throat> you know, uh, well, we know more about uh, Siberia uh, than we know about China. Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's shocking, really. How and it's partly their fault uh, because they mm. remained so insular for so long they weren't sharing mm. information with the outside world. So this is comparatively new. However, there's um, no excuse for us now. 
there isn't any excuse at all. No. No. Um, no. And hopefully uh, we'll, so, you know, sort of begin to address <laughs> the balance of that, you know, as, as time unfolds yeah. and we uh, get a bit more adventurous with stuff we report on. Mm. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, shall I um, shall I find something else to thing. talk about? Um, I think what uh, what were we going to talk about next? Oh, very good. This is wonderful. Well, it is you know because uh, it's on our back garden, as it were. Um, Yorkshire's Stonehenge of the nation, uh, Stonehenge of the North, gifted to the nation. Um, so yeah, there you have. Uh, photograph of well two of the henges of uh, thornborough henge near ripon up in uh, yorkshire uh just a spectacular site that quite a few people know about have heard of thornborough henge but probably don't know how um extraordinary it is anyway the story is that um they've been gifted to the nation um the thornborough henges complex um you know, dating, we're talking about 3,500, I, I would say 2,500, something like that, um, around about a similar time to Avery, if not just a bit before. But the land um, that uh, it was, uh, that it's on, <coughs> that they're on, I should say, um, has it hitherto belonged to tarmac, you know, the great... <laughs> Um, people responsible for uh, extracting gravel from uh, our landscape. And not only from them, you know, because there was always a slight, slight threat that they were going to dig through the, the hinges to get more gravel out of the gown. But, but it's been under threat from other uh, sources as well. Um, but that is, but the uh, although I think the two hinges in the south have been protected hitherto, um, the uh, it has now been passed into the ownership of English heritage, um, uh, Thornborough Henges. Um, although you can only see uh, two uh, henges in that uh, image, um, there is a third um, up further north, which is uh, surrounded by trees. And the one in the trees is by far the one that's best preserved. You know, that little copse of trees seem to, seems to have pr protected it wonderfully. So we've not just got the three henges up there. We've uh, got an extraordinary landscape associated with it. Of uh, Several other henges uh, nearby burials. There's a cursus that goes straight across uh, um, that's connected to the central um, henge. Uh, there are uh, post alignments, uh, all sorts of things. And... Um, the fact that the arrangement of the three in the landscape echoes the arrangement of Orion's belt <laughs> uh, in in the sky, which you know, uh, <coughs> yeah, causes quite a lot of uh, discussion and, uh, uh, and theories about what Thornborough Henge was about. Um, so uh, that's the basic news of that. Um, Rupert, shall I run um, that little movie? Uh, that I made, uh, just so people get an idea, because I don't want to yeah, yeah, sort of idea. go uh, a, away from this without. So um, yeah, let's uh, see that. This is from something we did in the prehistory show um, a, a year or two back. I think it's a cu couple of years uh, back, where I used to go out in the field and report back. So um, this is just a few minutes from from that. Now, I've never been here before. Um, but I happen to know that just over in there, in those woods, uh, is something quite extraordinary. And although the name is known, it is quite overlooked. So, uh, as I say, I've not been here before. Um, and this is something of a recce for me. And uh, so I hope you enjoy this um, little voyage of discovery. Uh, as much as I do, and uh, you know, hopefully we're all seeing this uh, for the first time together. Okay, let's go. And <laughs> believe it or not, 
and just stepped onto the bank of an enormous henge. How is it possible, <laughs> you're thinking, for a monument like this to be hidden away from sight in a wood, no signs, no nothing? This is one of the most significant, if not largest, henge monuments uh, in Britain. Not only that, but there's two more of them just south, within a mile. This, we're told, is the least disturbed of the three henges, and actually, probably, of all henges. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, rather disguised by the fact it's covered in woods. Uh, of course, it would have been open. Um, but in terms of preservation, this is pretty good. I mean, the ditch down there is pretty... Pretty, I should think it would have been at least uh, twice as deep as that. It's absurd. It's just incredible to be here uh, and to be standing, you know, aside from Orkney and aside from uh, Wiltshire and the, the Stonehenge landscape. This has got to be as significant, at least, as any of them. And yet here it is, hidden away in the quiet. I think I'm standing now at the, uh, the northern entrance. So let's cross over the northern entrance here. Wow. Across the ditch. Let's come into the middle. That's it. Um, that's as far as we got with that. I thought there was a bit more with uh, 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 some drone footage of the thing. Uh, I don't know. That probably wasn't enough to con convey the um, a magnificence of that site hidden away in, in the trees there. Um, what else can I say uh, uh, about Thornborough? What from a practical point of view, though, it raises a couple of interesting things as far as uh, English heritage taking over the site is concerned. It says in, in the article that it is now open to the public. Well, it kind of always was, <laughs> although um, uh, uh, Tarmac may have owned the land. There was a, a, a kissing gate, you know, and a little sign, so anybody could go in and, and wander about in the... Uh, the, the the two open uh, henges there so at this moment on the ground n nothing will have changed but it's a question of you know uh, obviously it falls into English heritage's um, uh, care you know so that, that's one aspect of it but I'm wondering is uh, do they really want more visitors up there? Because I tell you, those roads around there, as you saw before I went into the woods, and uh, the one that cuts across between the other two henges, uh, is very narrow. And the, the adjacent village, uh, Thornborough itself, is very quiet. I don't think those people want vast numbers of visitors going. Yeah, well, Little, Little Giants has commented, uh, worried about restricted access to the third henge, though, if visitor numbers increase. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, in absolutely, fact, yeah. you know, we, we were joking about it when the news came out that English Heritage had uh, got it. Uh, you know, we were joking about, well, I mean, they're just going to put fences up and have a ticket box, you know, a ticket uh, yeah. office, yeah. Uh, which is a little bit mean of me to say that um, because English Heritage do wonderful work. But, uh, but you know, it, it, it is a worry when you get sites that have always been just there for anybody to visit. And, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I can't doing. see there being uh, any adequate logistics being there for them to put anything up resembling some kind of a visitor centre, you know, and anticipating those kinds of, uh, of numbers. So I'll, I'd be, just be interested to see what form, you know, factor it takes uh, it coming under English Heritage's uh, auspice. Um, the, the, I mean, you read about people being disappointed by Stonehenge for crying out loud when they visit it. Imagine, <laughs> yeah, but they, you can't save those people, can you? No, you can't save those people. It's, 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 
you know, beyond help. It's a, um, uh, you know, the the other two are sort of nice grassy banks to have a picnic on, but uh, as far as visuals yeah. are concerned, yeah. however, some interesting trip advisor comments, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> however, when the imagination <laughs> takes uh, takes off, as far as those hinges are concerned, you have to be there to appreciate their size. Uh, and magnificence and you know really yeah. think hard about what they were for uh, it's no coincidence that they're not far from you know the main arterial road the a1 going up there uh, you know which is based on the old roman road which is based on whatever uh, and also you've got the devil's um, arrows not far down which sort of point um, which are actually just off the a1 which point towards Thornborough. So what was going on? I exp my thing is, uh, well, it's uh, almost you know, certainly uh, think, a huge fair taking place at certain times uh, of the year, and people from all over the country yeah, descending upon it. I agree. I, I yeah. think it's particularly interesting. In fact, do you know what? There, there's a book by Christopher Knight and Alba called For the Pyramids, and uh, their theories, they're quite compelling, um, actually, but they think that that arrangement of uh, matching Orion's belt, which is exactly the same as the arrangement of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau. And they think that uh, Thornborough, the precursor to, is basically the design uh, stage, if you like, of, uh, of Giza. Now, if you read the book, their argument is quite compelling when you look at the data. But one of the things that is particularly fascinating uh, here for me anyway is that the the origins of most of the constellations is locked in the mist of time we we know to a degree when they might have been given uh, roman names uh, but the actual constellations themselves their origins is completely lost in time and it's very interesting that orion as a constellation has got something to do with hunting in lots of different cultures. And yeah. so the fact that uh, that it could be a relevant constellation at a time of year that might be associated with whatever kind of feasting, and uh, and the fact that there's three massive henges that a lot of you will know that, you know, Mike and I have suggested more than once that, uh, you know, we think henges are a lot more to do with animal husbandry and sporting arenas so the fact that they echo what is a constellation which is known to relate to hunting yeah. and uh, it's a nice and bit of branding it's, yeah it's, it's it's very good branding uh so you know i i would uh i would love to do some uh geophys on them because uh, yeah. I think that each of them would be different. I think only one of them will have timber upright posts. And uh, anyway, we won't go there. Uh, I yeah. want not to, quite want to uh, the Rico arena, but um, you know, yeah, <laughs> the Orion um, arena. But... <laughs> and also, I, it has to be said, um, I don't think it's any accident at all that j just a few miles away, Harrogate, you've got the great Yorkshire showground. Well, you've got the same kind mm. of arrangements. You've got multiple uh, arenas for pe farmers to come, show their animals, walk them around, yeah. show off their tractors, show off their, you know, <laughs> uh, the sporting stuff. You know, yeah. it's just, I don't think it's yeah. coincidence. Graham, thank you. I don't yes. think it's coincidence. I can, oh, no, it's the wrong one. I thought I had in my hand. <laughs> what are you hand. doing? I thought I had this one in my hand. What are you doing? Thank <laughs> God it wasn't a copy of paper. No, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, Graham was recommending it. There we go. So anybody ah, okay. that, uh, you know, wants to recognise it in a bookshop, uh, whatever. Um, I mean, fascinating because, you know, think about all the stuff that is written about Stonehenge. Think about all the stuff that's written about Avebury, come to that. This is pretty much mm -hmm. the only published work yeah. that you can get you know it's pretty comprehensive thank goodness and he's done his work gee has he done a lot mm. of work uh, jan harding uh, on this but uh, it's been his obsession mm. obviously um but you yeah. know that's pretty much only the one thing it's such an important site 
Yeah. Okay. I want to pick up on a comment uh, a yeah. little while back. Uh, Chris Beaner uh, said, I wonder how many other henges are hidden away in woodlands that perhaps not so large. And uh, it's uh, an interesting thing. Uh, if you, do you know what, can you remember the LIDAR website? Uh, they've. Yeah. Uh, it's by no means across the whole of Britain, but a lot of LIDAR scanning has been done over the last few years. Uh, LIDAR basically being uh, laser readings of the ground taken from from the air. And there are so many places where, uh, in fact, there's one in particular that I, I found on a map in Andover that, or near Andover, uh, that uh, it's it, you look on it on Google Earth now, and it's just it's just forest, but right there in the middle of the forest is what looks like a henge. There must be so many of them that you know yeah. even on the ground you you might not be able to uh, see them at all, but from the air those variations in the soil uh, will still register. So yes, yeah, so many, so many. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's good. I'm glad we've um, uh, covered Thornborough. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do a, th um, a more in-depth thing about Thornborough at some future date. However, I think we uh, we should m move on. Um, I'm just thinking, where are we? Oh, we're not doing too badly for time. I think, you know, we talked about, we talked about um, uh, Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge uh, right at the top of the show and, and said that uh, if people didn't know what that was, um, then we would talk about it a bit later on. <clears throat> Many of you already know, and as we said, thanks, you know, deep heartfelt thanks to uh, all of you who've contributed so far to the uh, the project. We did so at the top of the program, um, but we've got a little way to go, um, a little way to go. I'd say we are at least probably three quarters of the way there, which is mahusive, which is which is <laughs> great. Um, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge is our proposed uh, five series, probably more, don't know, but, you know, on a ballpark figure, five series, epic uh, exploration of the whole story of the Neolithic from right over from the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, uh, right through Europe, up the Danube, Black Sea, Balkans, across the Mediterranean, uh, round and Andalusia, up the Atlantic seaboard and to Brittany, and eventually, of course, uh, to... Uh, to uh, Britain and our own Neolithic and our own megaliths and uh, finishing up uh, on Salisbury Plain uh, with Stonehenge and that's the story <laughs> what have we taken on what are we doing <laughs> that's the story uh, you we only want live to once. <laughs> yeah but we think we can we can we can do such a good flavor of it in in five uh, five parts and the first part uh, for the first part, we want to go to Turkey to start our uh, adventure at Gobekli Tepe and the other tepes and various other sites with claim to very early beginnings for uh, farming uh, and the beginning of agriculture, the beginning of the Neolithic in, uh, in Mesopotamia and, and Turkey. Also, uh, cattle hoyuk, uh, places like that, and also the trade that was going on into the Aegean Sea that caused you know, some of the expansion of farming. Um, beginning of the expansion further further west so we're raising funds to fund the first term um, episode of that on um, on uh, buy me a coffee uh, as uh, this uh, uh, at this very moment like i say we're we're nearly at our goal but we need to uh, press on with it just a little bit more so i'm sure you'll all bear with us uh, as we run our little promo video uh, to let you know what it's all about, those who don't already know. We would like you to help us to take you on an extraordinary journey. We're asking you to help us answer the question of not only how did this amazing monument down here in the south of France come to be, this is the Domaine des Fades near Cyril, but what led to the construction of thousands and thousands of megalithic monuments throughout northwestern Europe and ultimately at the end of the Neolithic period Stonehenge about a thousand miles that way on the Salisbury Plain.
The answer isn't here nor on Salisbury Plain. And in order to even begin to tell the story of the Neolithic, we need to be somewhere else. And at another time, thousands of years even before this ancient monument was built. And for that, we need to head east. is in helping to tell the story of how, from the earliest farming in Mesopotamia in the Fertile Crescent, humans came to leave their mark on the world in the form of the great tombs, henges and megaliths that we wonder at today. We plan to make a series of films to illustrate that story, and we'd like your help. We need your support to raise the funds necessary to begin filming the series, starting right now with the first episode. Supporting this project is really easy. We have a Buy Me A Coffee webpage where you can make a contribution for as little as $5, or as much as you want. Each and every single dollar raised will go towards the travel and subsistence costs necessary for each stage of filming. You'll find loads more information about our plans and our funding goals on our Buy Me A Coffee website. For the moment, though, it seems that we've come as far as we can. In front of us is the Mediterranean Sea. That way, that way lies Italy, Sardinia, Greece, the Aegean, Turkey, Cyprus, northeast. What have we got northeast? We've got the Great Steppe, we've got the Balkans, up the Danube. Yeah. Ah, the brief. That way. What do we got that way? Uh, well, if we turn right, go that way, turn right, then we go along the bottom part of Spain, of Andalusia, and you know, up then up the Atlantic seaboard, up to Brittany, which leaves only one place left to go, really, isn't it? Go home for us. Yes. Yeah. The point is, we're going to have to visit all these places if we're going to stand a chance, any chance at all, of explaining the presence on Salisbury Plain of a set of sarsen stones we call Stonehenge. Yes, yeah, so please donate now and help us to start that journey. We thank you very much indeed. <laughs> So there we are. Actually, we're talking with uh, Lee Clare, who's one of the lead archaeologists, uh, head archaeologist, I think, at Gebekli Tepe at this uh, very He's moment. He's coordinating archaeologist. Coordinating so. archaeologist. Uh, we're talking to Lee on Tuesday morning to start uh, getting together lo the logistics for when we do go over what the best timing is and uh, how the land lies post-earthquake uh, at, yeah. at the moment and, and what that means. Um, um, yeah. So, um, great. Uh, thank you for bearing with us as we show that again. We will uh, unashamedly be running at it right at the end of the programme, so you don't have to watch all the way to that. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's it. We shall be repeating the showing of the uh, of the video. Um, but it, We shall. Say. And thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. We've got oh. a super chat from Jay as well. Oh, bless you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Whoever you are, wherever in the world you are. Somewhere in the UK, by the looks of it. Yes. Um, yeah, that's all we need to say about that, isn't it, Rupert? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. It's uh, it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, as you say, what have we done? It'll be great. It'll be great. Yeah. Do you, Just, do you need um, someone to come along and carry your bags for you? Um, no idea how many offers we've had. Of <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, digging for Britain. Prehistoric find shines light on Neolithic light. That headline um, doesn't give uh, half of it away, actually. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, this is the BBC site. Um, so um, Alice, um, um, uh, I've got her surname. Gee. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I can't think what? what it is either now. Alice. Oh, you're not. We're digging for Britain. You're talking about Alice Roberts. Alex Roberts, Rob yeah. Yes. How can you uh, forget Alex Roberts' surname? 
I just did. <laughs> you did that publicly on air. Jesus. <laughs> just don't tell her, all right? <laughs> yeah, if it makes sense. I'll, there, there she is. There she is. I was just going to ask her to come back on again. <laughs> Uh, well, my secret isn't safe with you, Soskin. I know that for a start. Uh, anyway, to the meat of it. Um, so uh, we've got the <coughs> discovery of a Neolithic era settlement is helping shed new light on how people lived on the shores of Loch Foyle some 5,000 years ago. Actually, it's a bit more than 5,000 years ago. 3,800 BC we're looking at. Um, mm. This is quite phenomenal, actually, because this, this is right up uh, <clears throat> uh, Northern Ireland, uh, right uh, on on the coast, near the coast there. Um, now, uh, as far as the process of the Neolithic settling of um, uh, Ireland and the British Isles is concerned, um, we've only had... To my mind, you know, sort of scant evidence, little spots hit here and there. There's, certain, there's the White Horse Stone uh, longhouse, and we've got loads of longhouses up in uh, in Scotland. But to have one occurring right up there in the north of Ireland to 3,800 BC um, is quite amazing. It gives, mm. I mean, I, I don't know, <laughs> maybe this is a little knowledge, it's, not as a bit of a dangerous thing, but it gives me the impression that when farming happened, when you know the farmers came over um, from uh, Brittany and and thereabouts, um, they were arriving everywhere all at once. You know, because these dates are, are pretty uh, commensurate with each other um, for yeah. the earliest longhouses, both right down in the south of England, right up in the north of it? Ireland. That's incredible. Mm. Um, uh, to, to my mind I mean it's uh, not an easy thing to find a, a Neolithic uh, longhouse but they're quite uh, unmistakable uh, in you know because they're big um, uh, you know they're much uh, you know, they would house several several not one family but quite quite a few and those post holes are big post holes mm. um, so supporting quite extraordinary um, stuff. I don't think we need to go particularly into the uh, the detail uh, of that. I keep saying five thousand year old homes, but um, mm. uh, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, cir I, it says circular dwellings, roundhouses are more typical of the Neolithic period, which occurred between four thousand and two thousand BC. But people have got to think about really dividing the Neolithic certainly uh, in in Britain uh, up a, in into um, sections a bit more, uh, bringing it all together. The whole one thousand <clears throat> uh, really the Neolithic uh, ends at two thousand five hundred, not two thousand BC. We're into the Bronze Age by two thousand BC. Yeah. So those fifteen hundred years, the early phases are marked by. Um, uh, these big houses, which didn't last for very long, and they're sort of um, contemporary with the building of the long barrows, uh, and uh, m more like that. But those traditions come to an end relatively quickly, you know, and then there's a sort of blank period in the middle before um, megalithic stuff starts going up uh, towards the end of the... Neolithic. So this, at the beginning of the Neolithic, up there, you know, really feeds into something that I think we've probably got to, it, it's helpful in terms of considering how the movement from the continent into Britain uh, ca came about, you know, which will feed into episode five of <laughs> Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge, so what uh, don't you think? Absolutely, um, and I I still have this vision of um, uh, you know when <laughs> when you've got the farming coming from continental Europe and coming up the western seaboard, so coming up potentially you know it's coming up between uh, the, the mainland Britain and Ireland, and they could have gone left and they could have gone right. Um, they did. I just. Uh, <laughs> 
I just really like I haven't even started trying to talk to these people, but there's some guys in Ireland who built a replica um uh, Neolithic boat and uh and they have tested it out at sea and they've done some pretty extensive stuff on the ocean and I, I just think that's gonna make some good T V if they'd let us use their boat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll see. They'll probably say no, but you've got to ask the question, haven't you? See, I we might so. have in our favour. I think that Alison Sheridan uh knows at least one of the guys on that team. And because Alison is very much in our camp, she might have a skill. You never know. Gotta try. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Wrong. Hey. But what could possibly... <laughs> like I said, you only live makes once. good television, though, doesn't it? A couple it, it, of, yeah, uh, well, absolutely. A couple, couple yeah. of eld elderly antiquarians drown off the coast of yeah, attempting to whatever. <laughs> no, uh, all much. this in Ferreter's Cove. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Don't go there. You see, you said it now. Yeah, <laughs> no, we can't know. Ferreter's Cove. Google it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, that's what I thought. <coughs> I thought fascinating from that article. Did, did you, either of you two take anything more from that? I mean, there's a lot of detail. I mean, it's so awful to gloss over what's an, an enormous archaeological dig like this because you know. I mean, you've had experience. I've had experience <coughs> of being on digs. It's no lightweight matter. The amount of work that goes into revealing what's there and uh, that's true um, but I, I think it's mm. fair to say though that, that the whole point of, of of these programs that you know that we do is is letting people know about excavations and archaeology around the world that they might not otherwise have heard of so I, oh. I don't think we need to go into the major detail it's just uh, you know because uh, folks you, you know you can always just take the the top details that we're giving you and and google it if you want to know more about them i mean uh, one of the things that I found particularly interesting about this one is that they have calculated, looking at the settlement as a whole, they think it could have been home to about 50 farmers. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's those kind of stats that I find interesting. When you, you, know, when you start to get um, a clearer idea of settlement size and how many people you can actually be talking about, uh, I find that quite interesting. I don't know what they're basing yeah. that on. I need to uh, get into source papers for that, and I haven't had time. But um, yeah. yeah, I think um, I think what struck <clears throat> me about it was the fact that this is another discovery that's been made because of development. So yeah. you know, the only yeah. reason that these uh, and that just seems to be uh, more and more and more these days that the only archaeology that is actually happening is because somebody's building a road or somebody's building a housing estate and yeah. they have to get the archaeologists in to check. And and yeah. I've been sort of flick-flacking between whether this is a positive thing <laughs> or not. <laughs> and, and, of course, you've got to remind yourself, yeah, that maybe they would never have found this settlement if uh, this housing estate mm. or what I forget what is going in there, yeah. but if it, it wasn't happening then yeah. maybe it would never have there, been there would be yeah. no reason to to go looking uh, and no, no even if a, an archaeologist thought oh that would be a good place to look making the case mm. to raise the funds to do an academic yeah. dig another question yeah. entirely no yeah. 95% uh, and it's fair to say that with a lot of the uh, of, with um, a lot of the excavations that come out of development it's the <clears> developers <throat> who actually pay yeah. for the excavations yeah. to be done because they need mm. it to be done as quickly as possible because they want to carry on building the houses or whatever. Uh, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, that's uh, it, it's such an important aspect of modern archaeology that it, it is entirely that. It's developers mm. paying for everything. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For those of you asking questions about uh, uh, Alice Roberts, uh, we have an idea in our mind to ask Alice to, to be on this show, actually. We haven't asked her yet, so don't uh, 
hold mm. your, your your breath, but uh, that's one thing we're going to be in touch with her. Uh, uh, she's uh, she's a busy bee, um, but you know she's been on the show before, and yeah, as um, it, oh, I mean, uh, not everybody probably that. not everybody knows uh, Rupert. You know, we did an interview with her. Uh, which year was it? I can't remember now. But if you dig down through, uh, you know, our stuff on the channel, uh, you'll find um, our interview mm. with her, which was lovely. You know, it was a great uh, great time. Um, okay, cool. Uh, are we, is, is that, is it time to move on? I think so. <clears throat> um, oh, and we're still, we're still, uh, in the UK, you know? Ancient road found beneath, uh, new town in Devon. Here we go again. Development, yeah. um, finding, uh, n new stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if uh, Ancient Road is that uh, exciting. Um, I don't, not too sure that they're that clear on the, on the dating of this road. Um, so they seem to be uh, saying it was a Roman road. Um, well, certainly a Roman road. road, but you know, you you don't know what the Romans were making use of. Um, no. Yeah, I, I thought there was more indication from the so sorts of. Um, uh, dwellings that were f they were finding round about, they were finding you know round houses and and things like that yeah. that they could um, probably push it back a bit more into the uh, uh, into the Bronze Age. So it's another example. It's a new town. They're building a new town, Sherford. Mm. Um, so yeah. yeah, scratch the surface. Uh, Lord knows what yeah. you're going to find. Actually, I wanted yeah. to ask you though. I mean, talking about ancient roads, you've got a fair few of them, or, or have you in in Cornwall, um, that are hidden in the landscape and thereabouts. You've uh, you've investigated at least one, I know. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there are a few. Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't have Roman roads, although there's there's. Uh, a talk uh, about the A30, the route that the A30 takes uh, being, you know, an ancient route uh, that's obviously, uh, you know, as time has gone on, has developed into our, the main artery that, that comes down in into Cornwall. But yeah, looking at that article actually made me, um, it reminded me, you know, when I was growing up, we were always told that the Romans never came to Cornwall. Uh, that you know that they they got as far as the Tamar and they decided not to go any further. And <laughs> but as as the decades have gone by, you know they're uncovering more and more Roman stuff in Cornwall. And actually, quite recently near Roach, um, I think the Digging for Britain uh, program went there uh, as well, actually, because they found um, a Roman camp there, which is huge. It covers like eighteen acres, I think. Mm. And they, they're saying it could have been uh, home to a, a legion of like 10,000 men, which is just wow. bonkers considering when I was growing up, we were told, yeah, the Romans never came. <laughs> they weren't here at all. What's a legion of 10,000 doing down there unless you need them to be down there? It was a holiday camp. Mm. They were they were coming down. <laughs> 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 I no know, idea. Say, and I'm near right. Roach as well. I, I mean, <laughs> the, the very notion that the Romans didn't get down to Cornwall seems strange to me. When yeah. you think that the entire reason for the destruction of the Druids was because the Romans wanted all the minerals uh, off, uh, yeah, uh, well, Wells and Anglesey particularly, uh, and so the notion that they weren't wanting to exploit. Uh, Tin and uh, and gold in Cornwall seems quite strange to me that anybody would no, think that. No, I mean, I, we we know that they were trading with the Cornish for those minerals for mm. for the tin. You know, we know that that was happening. Um, there's always been this mm. theory that um, they didn't need to subdue us. That the the Cornish were just like, yeah, you know, we carry on trading with you. We've got no arguments about it. You crack on with what you're doing, and <laughs> we'll just get on with our lives. So they didn't, yeah, we didn't yeah. put up any yeah, resistance yeah. because we already had that trading relationship with them. So didn't see them as you know the enemy. We saw them as you know they were trading partners or whatever. So, yeah, but no, there, there is a lot of of Roman stuff. Um, found in Cornwall. There's, there's Roman milestones 
and I think there's six or eight Roman milestones, you know, across the county. Right. So the implication is, you know, that they were moving through Cornwall and they were putting up structures where they needed them, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, there's, there's, a, there's a Roman inscribed uh, <coughs> st stone not far from Melanthol, isn't there? Uh, hang on, I'm trying to think. Down, down from... Is that a Roman stone? Maybe it is. I, I remember the stone you're talking about. Yeah. And Are you, you're you not talking right. about Menscrypha. Menscrypha. So, uh, so very near. Um, so you've got Menantol, and then in, yeah. in, almost in the field, uh, two or three fields away from, there's an inscribed stone called Menscrypha. Yeah. Is that the one you mean? It yeah. may be. That... Yeah. that that has got an inscription. I think it is a Latin inscription yeah, on it. Yeah. Um, and it's to do with, oh, they think that it's to do with some kind of tribal leader that was supposedly um, killed in oh, I some see. I see. I see. battle right. or something. And, and mm -hmm. this was put up in his, in his memory. Mm. So, yeah, that might be the one you mean. But, yeah, there's a few of them dotted around. But you folks down there in Cornwall have been trading tin for millennia, you know, <laughs> even before the Romans yeah. uh, uh, got there. Yeah. And that, that's a yeah. story for another day, you know, how extensive the tin yeah. trade was across, uh, yeah. reaching Indeed. down into the Mediterranean and across to... Oh, of course, uh, so you've got the ne Nebra Sky Disc as well, which is yeah. a connection yeah. that I yeah. just... I just love yeah. because the the gold that was on the Nebra Sky Disc came from yeah. a valley which is literally a mile and a half from from my house, which I yeah. find just in, incredible. Yeah, and and yeah. you know the tin and the bronze as well has been identified yeah. as, as being from Cornwall. I, I so. find it quite amazing, really, that uh, one of the things we we talked about it. Uh, on different shows before, but uh, comparatively recent, I think it was only last year, that they published a paper that they'd found some tin ingots that were found, uh, some were found in Greece, uh, that, uh, uh, in, associated with shipwrecks. They found some yeah. tin ingots uh, off Greece and they found some others uh, off Israel that are known to be Cornish tin. Um, and and the thing is that they predate the British Bronze Age. Uh, so, yeah. uh, yeah. so you're looking at these ingots, thinking, well, if it predates the British Bronze Age, what were the British doing with this tin? You know, what were they making with tin? Um, yeah. Because you know, it, it, why you know, why were they mining it? All those questions. Yeah, because yeah. clearly they were making ingots of them and they were selling it on or mm. trading it in some way. Um, mm. But before we were actually making bronze artifacts, yeah, it's just amazing, really. Love yeah. to know how trade occurred. Love to know, you know, what was going yeah. on. Oh, oh yeah, wonderful. for sure. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. Anyway, somehow we got from uh, a Roman road or whatever in Devon to tin they ingots did take, in some Israel. Of, some so, of the pottery that was some of the pottery that was found in this excavation that they dated to fifteen hundred BC. Ah, oh, right, yeah. Um, but that was as much as I got from it. That was pottery related, so I don't know. Um, yeah. So uh, it's there, and so are tin and gots in uh, uh, in Israel from Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rupert, you're down there in France. Uh, have you got sufficient notes to uh, sort of? You know what the uh, uh, so uh, this is we we don't need to dwell for a long time on this. The uh, the nice thing about this the the, the Mondrian cave is three hours drive from me yeah um i could pop up there tomorrow I'm not going to um but <laughs> um but they found uh these um that's not arrowheads. gold by the way that is flint <laughs> it is flint yeah, yeah. Uh, basically they, they just found in this cave they can uh they can push uh bow and arrow technology back as it says uh to fifty four thousand years ago yeah. Um, and I, it, it's not, it's not that this should be a surprise, 
it's just that it's always wonderful when they actually find evidence for something you know because yeah. there's so much that we don't mm. know about human history and so much of this you know we avoid certain things because sometimes it's crossing the boundary into anthropology and that's not really what we're about um yeah. But being able to push these technologies back deeper into human history is interesting. And so it's just a, another step backwards in time. You look like you're going to say something, Michael. Yeah, uh, one thing that uh, I was curious about with, with this, I don't know if you'll be able to throw any light on it, whether you went through to, because there was a paper associated with this, and I don't know if you went through to it and tried to read it. It says, if I've the emergence of... Mechanically propelled weapons in prehistory is commonly perceived as one of the hallmarks of the advance of modern human populations into the European mm. continent. The existence of archery has always been more difficult to trace. The recognition of these technologies in the European Upper Paleolithic has been hampered by ballistic overlaps between weapons pro projected with a thruster or a, or a bow. Now, what gets mm. me about this is they seem to have been able to discern that these, from these blades, that they belong with bow and arrow weaponry rather than with the hand-thrown thruster <laughs> weaponry. Yeah. And, and I yeah. asked the question, how? I mean, obviously, yeah. there's an answer, but I haven't been able to... There's nothing in this article that really tells me that, how they've actually no, managed I, to uh, it's, make it's the discernment. We don't, uh, we don't have uh, James... Uh, our fingertips at the moment because I'm sure what, James. What the tell Dilly? Us. James <laughs> Dilly. Yeah. There's the cave. Um, anyway, that's that's a site that keeps on giving, isn't it? To uh, Grot uh, Mandra. I'd quite like to go actually. Yeah. Uh, so there, there I, we I are. Can't. That that's a sort of reconstruction of uh, how these tips yeah. would have been uh, 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 applied yeah. to uh, things. Um. So, you know, yeah, what the I, difference I, is, I, I, I don't, don't know. know. It's a size thing or what what have you. But the important no. thing is, I think we need to drill in, is the date we're talking about, Fifty? did I mention it? Did any of us mention it? 54,000? Um, I did. You, you did. Said it again. I think it's always, repetition <laughs> is always good. <laughs> don't you think? Um <laughs> yeah, I mean, without sort of reading the whole article now, um, I don't know if there's more weight we can uh, we we can g gain there. But it, I mean, uh, as the authors say, it is a, a significant thing being able to thrust um, the, the date of these um, back some significant mm. time. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, Neronian culture. Love to know. Yeah, there is such a thing, apparently. Um, um yeah yeah it's it, it's um it's basically in this region i mean it's interesting that uh, there are crossovers in my head and i'd need to look it up but you've got the uh, crossovers with the uh, salutrian culture came later but that's all from the mm -hmm. same sort of part of the world mm. uh, yeah as in that lower paragraph the their analysis shows that a significant number of them were used as armatures for arrows propelled with a bow I, how did they know mm. that from the uh, mm. things themselves? That's the only, the only question. Um, um, but a fascinating, uh, fascinating yeah. article. Uh, all yeah. the same. That's the salient point: is uh, is uh, archery in Europe has been pushed back to fifty four thousand years ago. So that's that's the crux of it, anyway. Yeah, indeed. Next, ready? Yeah. Archaeologist brain surgery. <laughs> brain surgery. Pre prehistoric brain surgery. Really? Archaeologists uncover <laughs> early evidence of brain <laughs> surgery in ancient Near East. Should we deal with the headline first? It's so naughty, naughty, naughty. Well, it, it, it's kind of naughty. It's not wholly naughty. The, the, the reason for this... Would we be that naughty? Uh, I, and I, well, I, the thing my is, I, I had know, to look this be. up because there's there's, uh, there, there's something that niggled me uh, to begin with, and that's that they talk about uh, trephination. You can see there in the first line, archaeologists know that people have practiced cranial trephination, blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, and and I thought, well, normally they'd call it trepanation. What's the difference? And if you look up trepanation and trepanation, uh, most entries will tell you that they're synonymous, that it's just another word for the same thing. When you really want to get picky, then the difference is that trepanation is a surgical procedure and trepanation is making a hole in the skull that may not necessarily be for medical purposes. You know, you can drill a hole ah. in somebody's head if you want to release a spirit or, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, uh. But trepanation is a specific a surgical procedure. And the reason they're saying it in this context is because the way this um, cut has been made, this rectangular hole has been made in the skull, is is a surgical it's a, it's a known surgical thing from uh, from prehistory mm. um and i don't you, you can see there's illustrations yeah. up there the, the the irony though is that uh, they know that uh, the individual didn't survive this um didn't survive this experience anyway <clears throat> so uh, yeah. whatever the reason might have been for so... them attempting uh, the uh, the person that this operation was performed on was one of two brothers. Uh, yes, and he, uh, they know he wasn't very well from whatever some sort of congenital or bacterial um, problem that and they it's can also tell from the rest that, of the bones. That, uh, they, it's possible that it was leprosy, but they oh. they haven't been able to uh, establish that. Yeah. Yet, which is interesting. We should also say, um, haven't actually said where this is, have we? It's um, oh, sorry, uh, oh, we haven't scrolled down enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's in the headline. That's um, um, uh, but it's Rachel Kalisher, PhD candidate, Brown University's uh, Jakowski Institute for Archaeology in the Ancient World, led the analysis uh, on excavated remains of two upper class brothers who lived in Med uh, Megiddo. Megiddo. I've looked up the pronunciation of that. It's Megiddo, uh, 15th century um, BCE. So we're back in the Near East again, okay? Mm. It's, uh, it's Israel. It's um, sort of near the coast, halfway up Israel. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Basically. Uh, it would have been a very uh, important town at the time. Uh, you know, uh, one of those great trade centres uh, yeah. up in the east. I found it interesting that they were buried with... Um, uh, with Cypriot pottery, um, so uh, the various it's far reasons away. why it's in. It's not far away, but the interesting thing about the the link with Cyprus is: uh, do you remember we did an article about opium that they'd proven oh, yeah. that pots were being used for opium, oh, and yeah. the pots were known to um, from Cyprus, uh, whereas the opium had come from somewhere else. So th th there was you know, there was this interchange trading going on to bring one thing to another. So the fact that there was Cypriot pottery in a burial in Israel with people who were sick, yeah. uh, I just found that connection uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, it, but, it's fascinating, um, you know, what, what would have been going on in terms of trade um, round about that time. I've just been reading, mm. actually, interestingly, about that area, that the currents in the eastern Mediterranean there would have been going counterclockwise. So the route would have, if you'd have started, you know, in Israel, it, the easy way to go round that bit is to go north. So it would have taken you up to Cyprus and then round maybe to the uh, mm. maybe into the Aegean, you know, mouth of the Black Sea, mm. etc. But then you'd have to get back down, sort of, um, the, 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 to follow the circular tree um, um, current. You really, mm. best idea would be go down to Crete and then cut across, cut right down to um, Egypt, to the Nile Delta, and then back up round... <laughs> You know, that would be a circular thing. I'm sort of, we're digressing a little bit. This is getting far away from brain surgery. Um, True. <laughs> we do yeah. know that they were pretty, pretty damn canny ocean going people, though. Uh, yeah. there, there's, uh, I'll just read you a little bit of this report. 
here. Have you got uh, the? Uh, this is your actual report. Yeah, these oh, yeah, go for were it. obviously living with some pretty intense pathological circumstances that in this time would have been tough to endure without health and status. Uh, if your elite, this is from uh, Kalisha, the main researcher. Uh, if you're elite, maybe you don't have to work as much. If you're elite, maybe you can eat a special diet. If you're elite, maybe you're able to survive a severe illness longer because you have access to care. In her analysis, Kalisha spotted several skeletal abnormalities, abnormalities in both brothers. The older brother had an additional cranial suture and an extra molar in one corner of his mouth, sitting he may have had congenital syndrome, such as cladocranial dysplasia. I don't know what that is. Uh, both of the brothers' bones show minor evidence of sustained iron deficiency anemia in childhood, which could have impacted their development. Uh, it does go on at length um, about different pathological issues yeah. but um but i don't think we should know, do <laughs> uh, it, it's not relevant here it's the fact no. that they mm. have uh, made this uh, distinction uh with the type of surgical attempt at surgical procedure so whether they were trying to remove pressure from uh from the brain or uh, or, or maybe there was a tumor that they're theorizing about that and they're going to be oh, doing no. more tests on the bones but whichever that. way we're not yeah. talking about brain surgery which is uh, another world in entirely yeah um, just in, in in case i think the point is that you might be because if they carefully cut out that size of piece of skull in order to remove uh, tumor. Yeah, I'm distinguishing brain surgery in terms of when you do surgery in, a, in order to alter the, you know, to, to uh, alter the functioning of the brain or there's something wrong with the brain itself. You, know, you might not moving, be. If you're removing a tumor, that, uh, that's, that's, that's restoring normal function. Yeah, I wouldn't call it brain surgery, though. But we're getting into semantics. We better not. Wouldn't you? <laughs> well, no? I would. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ask a brain surgeon then. I would. I'd get a brain surgeon on. Any brain surgeons in the chat? Doctors on a postcard, please. Yeah. Um, but the other thing to to watch out for is in the same article the does does make the point that uh, trepanation has been going on for yonks. You know, it's not suddenly invented in uh, Israel in 1500 BC. It goes right back. Evidence for it goes right, 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 right back. Uh, Do you remember how living back? And I lot, can't. Lot. I put it up uh, more than once, and I don't remember how far back the oldest trepanation is. Well, you know, it's a, it's into the Neolithic, it's whichever old. part of the world you, you, you're looking at. But I remember when we did the um, article about uh, six thousand BC, six thousand BC. But I remember when we were doing our article about violence in in the Neolithic, that there was some warning somewhere that uh, some things that have been interpreted as trepanation may actually be blunt force, not, not blunt force trauma, but actually arrows, <laughs> um, arrow piercings. And that's been interpreted as, as trepanation because they look like uh, drilled holes. Uh, and yeah. uh, it may be... Can you imagine a, the frustration if you tried to kill someone and they go, oh, God, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can sure. we just acknowledge that it, it just it, it comes to something when you let someone go at your skull with a hammer and chisel, you know, <laughs> this is um, like, oh, yeah, I, I can't imagine. I mean, I think it's serious bad enough just stuff. to think back to a few hundred years ago when you were going for a, a, an amputation with nothing more than a, 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 you know, a bottle of whiskey. Uh, or just a tooth out. And, you know, there's some guy pulling it out. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. People still want yeah. to go back into the past, you know, this romantic notion of the past. I think oh. toothache is just, well, it's just one thing. That says, <laughs> no, do you, want, you might want to reassess. Yeah, I mean, yeah. how do you like your, how do you like your pain? I'm just going back uh, to this instance, though. I'm, I'm interested, you know, in the detail of that. You can see the cut marks that are mm. going on there. Um, uh, I would... Uh, I would submit to you, Malud, that the implement there was was obsidian. Would you not? Oh, it was made I, of obsidian. I, I would think you would want it to be, wouldn't you? 
Yeah, you would. You, would. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want yeah. blood instrument. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, there's a question. <laughs> is is obsidian still used as sur uh, surgically? Because it is still the sharpest stuff. Uh, you know, they surgical use steel, notwithstanding. Stuff, don't they? So what's yeah, but he? I think they use they use diamond they use the drills. Heads drills, yes, but but as a cutting yeah. edge, obsidian is as still blade, the sharpest yeah. thing you can uh, um, no you idea. can get. It's a good question. I mean, they certainly don't need to in surgery because uh, a a modern surgical steel scalpel blade is unbelievably sharp. Mm. Um, We're quite easy to cut, aren't we? The human, the human yeah. you don't need anything too sharp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it, it was interesting, you know, James, uh, on the last show, James was giving us the stats on, because he worked with obsidian uh, quite a bit, and and the fact that obsidian is the the one raw material that you can uh, you know that you can take the blade down, the blade down to one molecule thickness, uh, and it's the only substance that you can do that with, and wow. that's an astonishing. <clears throat> Um, yeah. Is that is that they do yes they do yes um, use obsidian in surgery, Jeff Chap. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. It may be something else, but uh, I, I okay. So. Uh, oh, obsidian is used for cutting soft tissue and has been used in eye surgery. surgery. Well, yeah. Oh it's, uh, wow! Hundred times sharper okay. than any steel blade. Yeah, that's astonishing. Thought so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and on that bombshell, I fear it is really time for us to begin uh, wrapping up now the show. Time to say goodbye. Yes, well, we we don't have a whimsy for you tonight. I'm afraid we couldn't find anything funny. No, it's unless you find, uh, uh, unless you find, uh, Bronze Age uh, brain surgery funny. Um, um, yeah, I'd, yeah, it's close. The uh, toilet was sort yeah. of almost there, but you know, yeah. no, it didn't really yeah. cut it. Sorry, it there's no funny. whimsy to finish off with. We'll do better next month. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I, I, I just I say, I think Ni uh, Nigel might have gone. Uh, I, uh, Nigel said good night earlier on. Oh, um, oh good night, Nigel. I, I think, yeah, good night, Nigel. Um, good night, yeah. Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what is the time? Well, that's been a long one. Uh, thank you for sticking around, folks. Um, oh, thank you, as ever, for sticking around. Yes, uh, you uh, really make our day every time. Obviously, this is uh, this is being recorded, so this will be around for uh, posterity. Um, to watch at any time. Um, but that's it. There's not very much more to say yet. Um, I've been a mahoosive thank you to Lizzie for joining us. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for asking me. I feel very honoured to be asked. Hey, no, we do hey, like any time. We'll, uh, we, we won't leave it so long <laughs> next time. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, no. Oh, and well, you are going to come to Cornwall. So that we we are. No, we really are. We, we yeah, really yeah, are. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, yeah. you said that about two years ago, so, you know, I won't hold my breath. I know, uh, I know, and then, uh, uh, well, you know what it's like. Yeah, yeah. I know, yeah, I, yeah. Know. I can't, you know can't even get my act together to finish a film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, it, uh, we're both, we both just, I think, well, I could speak for the three of us, just so much to do all the time. Yeah. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, just prioritise Everything. Um, Everything. I, I want to answer <laughs> something that somebody said earlier on as well. Watcher said, wish you had PayPal so I could send you some funds. Uh, Watcher, oh. thank you. Thank you for the thought. So, so, so much. Um, apart from anything else. Uh, it is true. <clears throat> buy me a coffee for whatever reason doesn't actually connect with PayPal. But um, yeah. um, uh, I think yeah. the, the thanks button which probably doesn't appear until the it's over <coughs> um, uh, takes PayPal. I don't, I don't know. But uh, thanks for the thought anyway. Gee whiz. Yes, you know, no, we, it's, we, uh, we appreciate that. Yeah, thank we, you. We, we don't take anything um, uh, at all for granted. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, bless you all. Hope you enjoyed that, Lizzie. I did. Of course I did. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Uh, no, we'll, oh, we'll, we'll, in fact, we'll, we'll have to try and figure out a time to uh, to get down to you and uh, uh, yeah. and go stomp. I have a list of places that I think you would yeah. enjoy. So. Yeah, 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 excellent, yeah. excellent. We, we will do it definitely. Yeah. All right. All right. Terrific. Well, um, well, thanks again, folks. Thank you. And with that, uh, as promised, I'm going to run the uh, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge video once more uh, to to play us out. See you next time. Um, yeah, and stay well till then. Bye bye from me. And uh, bye bye from me. Oh, s- <laughs> s- snappy on your cues there, guys. <laughs> Oh, bye for me as well. I'm looking at Lizzie. And she's... <laughs> I'm ending it now. We would like you to help us to take you on an extraordinary journey. We're asking you to help us answer the question of not only how did this amazing monument down uh, here we in are South muted of France now. come to be. This is the Domaine de Fade okay. near Ciron. But what led to the construction of thousands and thousands of megalithic monuments throughout Northwestern Europe, and ultimately, at the end of the Neolithic period, Stonehenge, about a thousand miles that way, on the Salisbury Plain? The answer isn't here, nor on Salisbury Plain. And in order to even begin to tell the story of the Neolithic, we need to be somewhere else. And at another time, thousands of years even before this ancient monument was built. And for that, we need to head east. Our passion is in helping to tell the story of how, from the earliest farming in Mesopotamia in the Fertile Crescent, Humans came to leave their mark on the world in the form of the great tombs, henges and megaliths that we wonder at today. We plan to make a series of films to illustrate that story and we'd like your help. We need your support to raise the funds necessary to begin filming the series starting right now with the first episode. Supporting this project is really easy. We have a Buy Me A Coffee webpage where you can make a contribution for as little as $5 or as much as you want. Each and every single dollar raised will go towards the travel and subsistence costs necessary for each stage of filming. You'll find loads more information about our plans and our funding goals on our Buy Me A Coffee website. For the moment though, it seems that we've come as far as we can. In front of us, is the Mediterranean Sea. That way, that lies Italy, Sardinia, Greece, the Aegean, Turkey, Cyprus, northeast. What have we got northeast? We've got the Great Step, we've got the Balkans, up the Danube. Yeah. Ah, the grief. That way. What have we got that way? Uh, well, if we turn right, go that way, turn right. Then we go along the bottom part of Spain, of Andalusia, and you know, up then, up the Atlantic seaboard, up to Brittany, which leaves only one place left to go, really, isn't it? Going home for us, yes. Yeah, the God. point is we're going to have to visit all these places if we're going to stand a chance, any chance at all, of explaining the presence on Salisbury Plain of a set of sarsen stones we call Stonehenge. Yes, so please donate now and help us to start that journey. We thank you very much indeed.